الرحيم وكان الشيطان لربه كفورا وإما تعرضن عنهم ابتغاء رحمة من ربك ترجوها فقل لهم قولا ميسورا ولا تجعل يدك مغلولة إلى عنقك ولا تبسطها كل البسط فتقعد ملوما محسورا إن ربك يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء ويقدر إنه كان بعباده خبيرا بصيرا ولا تقتلوا أولادكم خشية إملاق نحن نرزقهم وإياكم إن قتلهم كان خطأ كبيرا Translation And you should give and spend at your needy relatives, poor individuals and travelers when they are in need and do not spend wastefully. Indeed, those who waste their resources are brothers of the devil and devil has always been ungrateful with God. And if you have to turn away these needy individuals because of not having enough resources and so you are expecting mercy from your God yourself, then speak or refuse to them with gentle words and do not make your hand chained to your neck so that you may not spend at all and do not extend it completely and thereby become blamed or insolvent. Indeed, your Lord extends provisions of resources for whom he wills and likewise restricts it as well. Indeed, he is all aware of his servant and all seeing and do not kill your children for fear of poverty. We provide for them and for you as well. Indeed, their killing is a great sin. Sadaqallah Thank you very much, Professor Shuja Bakar, for reciting this very relevant verse. Now I invite Professor Azim Alphonse to recite verses of the Holy Bible. I'll read from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. The word of God says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they'll prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he'll make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Professor Azim Alphonse. Now I would like to invite Mr. Muhammad Lutfullah for explaining the netiquettes of this panel discussion. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, greetings. Uh, my name is Muhammad Lutfullah Khan. I would like to explain some of the netiquettes for the event. Uh, and those are, uh, please rename yourself as follows. A brief institution name, a brief department name, your full name. To name yourself, uh, right-click your own video during the session, then select rename. If you face a bandit issue, turn off your video. Every participant will be muted by the host, except panelists and chief guests, and will be allowed to speak upon request and during QA session. Please post your question in writing in the chat box and please specify if the question is for a particular panelist. To moder uh, the moderators will invite you by name to ask your question during the QA session. The session will be recorded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lutfullah. It is now my privilege to invite Dr. Sikandar Hayat, who is the head of the PRC advisory board Dr. Sikandar Hayat is a distinguished professor of history and public policy and dean faculty of social sciences at Roman Christian College. 
from 2014 to 17, he was chair of the history department. Earlier from 2006 to 2012, he was directing staff research at the National Management College and Dean National Institute of Public Policy at National School of Public Policy, Lahore. From 73 to 2006, he was faculty member at the Qaid -e Azam University after serving for more than three decades, first at, in the Pakistan Studies Department and later in the Department of History. He retired as meritorious professor and chair of the Department of History. During this period between 91 and 95, he had the privilege of uh, performing the duties of educational counselor or head of education division at the Embassy of Pakistan in Washington, DC. Dr. Sikandar Hayat, sir, I invite you to please deliver the welcome note. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vakas. I'm grateful for your kind words. Uh, on behalf of the Population Research Center, PRC, it's my pleasure and indeed privilege uh, to welcome you all and uh, present this brief address on opportunities and threats, population growth in the way ahead. I'm grateful to Dr. Vakas uh, for, uh, of the PRC, you heard him right now, for providing the empirical evidence uh, for this brief uh, talk. The world population of 7.9 billion is growing faster at about 1.05% a year. The growth of population is not the same in different parts of the world, especially the rate of population growth in the global south is consistently higher than, uh, than, than uh, higher than, uh, compared to the countries in the global north. Pakistan being the fifth most populous country in the world is facing many serious challenges related to overpopulation. Conversely, almost 66% of the population is between the ages of 15 and 33 years. And the country has immense potential for leveraging this demographic dividend, provided, provided the development agenda of the country is aligned with the SDGs and a great emphasis is placed on human capital development. According to UNDP, Pakistan ranks 154th out of a total of 189 countries on the UN's Human Development Index. Overpopulation complicated by a high population growth rate and poor human resource development exposes Pakistan to many challenges related to poverty, education, healthcare, gender inequality, urbanization and migration, and food and water insecurity, to name a few more important ones. In 2020, <clears throat> Pakistan's GDP declined by 0.38%, the first negative annual growth rate recorded in a very long time. According to ADP, the percentage of people living in Pakistan below poverty line, which is roughly uh, $3.20 per day, was estimated to be almost 22.8% before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has now reached an estimated 40.9%, 40.9%. Pakistan has lost close to 30,000 lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. And according to Pakistan Bureau of Statistics, an estimated total of 20.6 million people out of a workforce of 55.74 million people have lost their jobs. During this time, while 6.7 million people experienced a decrease in their monthly income. Rapid urbanization is another challenge that Pakistan is facing due to overpopulation as recent estimates show that the rate of urbanization is 3% per annum. It is expected that in the aftermath of the pandemic, this rate is likely to increase. According to United Nations Population Division, half of the country's population will be living in urban areas by 2025. 
The question is, are we aware of the adverse effects of this migration? Rural to urban migration creates economic, political, and developmental challenges for a country. A rapid increase in the urban population in countries like Pakistan with a literacy rate of 62% overburdens the job market due to a greater demand for low income employment in urban areas. The situation is likely to worsen when one considers that almost one third of the children in Pakistan between the age of five to 16 years are out of school. Furthermore, due to a countrywide lockdown in 2020, almost 8% of school going children dropped out. According to State Bank of Pakistan, a total of 1.8 million people currently enter the job market every year, and the country needs an annual growth rate between 6 to 7% to absorb these people into the workforce, which is a far cry from the existing gro average growth rate of 3.94%. Uh, when the so-called youth bulge hits the job market, the demand for low income employment is likely to further increase, creating more pressure on an economy that already has a dwindling growth rate. While analyzing the impact of the low literacy and high unemployment rate on Pakistan, the gender-based disparities simply cannot be ignored. According to the Global Gender Gap Report 2021, Pakistan is ranked 153rd 153rd out of a total of 156 countries on the gender gap index. 54.5% of women are illiterate in Pakistan, while approximately only 16% of men are illiterate. Similarly, almost 85% males of working age are employed, while only 22.7% women in the country are employed. The gender gap evident in the women's access to education in the workforce is heavily influenced by prevalence of aggressive gender norms in the country. A household survey on factors associated with differences in gender norms showed that 43% of the men think that women should not be allowed to work. Similarly, According to PSLM 2019, fewer than 10% of households think women have the ability for autonomous decision-making. Women face multiple barriers when entering the labor market, which includes safe transportation, female facilities at the workplace, and the time constraints due to household duties. Policymakers should address this gender gap by not, by not only providing equal opportunities to both men and women, but formulating and implementing policies that challenge social and cultural norms, which constrain women's access to opportunities at the household and at the community level. Here we should acknowledge the efforts of organizations like the United Nations Population Fund uh, UNFPA in strengthening the capacity of the public sector and the civil society in Pakistan for working towards achieving gender parity in the country. Aging population also repre represents a marginalized group that is growing in size due to demographic transition and resultantly is becoming increasingly vulnerable. An estimate shows that 7% of the population is above 60 years of age, which is expected to reach 12.9% by 2050. Some of the major challenges that the aging population in Pakistan is facing include poverty and a def deficient old age benefits and pension system. Emotional and physical abuse of the elderly and health insecurity. 
The government of Pakistan, however, has been making efforts to improve the situation of the aging population in Pakistan. Under the Senior Citizen Act of 2014, a Senior Citizen Welfare Council was established and was given the responsibility of improving access to financial and healthcare resources for the elderly. The National Program for the Healthcare for Elderly, NPHCE, was also established by the Ministry of Health to increase the provision of preventive, curative, and rehabilitative services to the aging population in Pakistan. These are just a few of the many threats and challenges that Pakistan is likely to face due to overpopulation. To meet these challenges, there is a need to launch multi-sectoral nationwide campaigns that are guided by research-driven policy initiatives, specifically focusing on de-escalating the population growth rate, protecting vulnerable population groups, and leveraging the population dividend. Concurrently, these multi-sectoral campaigns and policy initiatives must also work towards conserving our natural resources and protecting the environment. I'm sure colleagues that are joining us from Lahore and Karachi have a first-hand experience of the smog resulting from environmental pollution in major urban centers of Pakistan. In this regard, Population Research Center, FC College, in collaboration with the Population Council Pakistan, United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, Higher Education Commission, HEC, and Office of Research, Innovation, and Commercialization Audit has organized this virtual panel discussion and conference. on population growth in the way ahead. We are very fortunate that we have been able to gather leading local and global experts in the field of demography and population studies to share their research, thoughts, and wisdom on these emergent issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sikandar, for an excellent presentation of the problems and issues that will be discussed today. It is now my pleasure to invite our chief guest, Dr. Jonathan Edelton. Dr. Jonathan Edelton is the rector of the Foreman Christian College. He was born and raised in Pakistan. Dr. Jonathan Edelton is a graduate of Murray Christian College. He has a PhD in international relations from Tufts University, Massachusetts, and a BSc in journalism from Northwestern U University, Illinois. A five-time USA admission director, he also served as ambassador to Mongolia and USAID representative to the European Union. As USAID mission director in Islamabad during 2006 and 7, he headed the USAID funded reconstruction effort in northern Pakistan following the devastating earthquake there in October 2005. Sir, we thank you for your services to Pakistan. I now request Dr. Jonathan Ayrton to deliver the inaugural address. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opp opportunity to open this international virtual conference on population growth. Thank you, especially uh, Dr. Mohamed Vakas for extending the invitation in the first place. Um, and thank you for everyone else at this event throughout Pakistan and abroad who are participating, whether as speakers, panelists, participants, or attendees. From my perspective, it's certainly an impressive event, and I'm appreciative that FCCU and its Population Research Center can be associated with it as a sponsor, along with the Population Council of Pakistan, UNFPA, HEC, and Foreman's Zone, OREC. As some of you may know, my own PhD dissertation more than a few years ago touched on a number of the same themes covered at this conference, especially related to international and to some extent domestic migration. Titled Undermining the Center, the Gulf Migration in Pakistan, and published by Oxford University Press, it provided an early look from the vantage point of the 1980s of a phenomena that would gather even more momentum in the years ahead. That said, while I have a professional interest in the subject at hand, I also have a personal interest, given the many familiar faces and names on the participant list, not only from Foreman Christian College, but also beyond. Uh, for example, I've never actually met Gavin Jones, uh, but I'm, I am familiar with his work, 
I also have tremendous respect for Dr. Zeba Sitar and her contributions to research and discussion on this topic in too many ways to count. Well, knowing that I will inevitably be missing a lot of people, let me quickly also give a shout out to Nasra Shah from the Lahore School of Economics and previously Kuwait University, and before that, the Population Institute at the East-West Center in Hawaii. I think she probably does not remember, but all those years ago, in the early 1990s, when I was a PhD student, she extended an invitation for me to fly from Boston to the East-West Center to present a paper on labor migration from Pakistan to the Middle East, my early topic of interest. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was the first professional paper I ever presented in my career. And uh, you can imagine as a graduate student to get this invitation out of nowhere, uh, well, not quite nowhere, out of, from Honolulu and say, here's the ticket, you wanna come? That meant a lot. And so thank you, uh, shout out all these years later. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, then of course, there's the representatives of the many institutions that are participating today, demonstrating the importance of, of not, of, of, of drawing on places in Pakistan and experiences in Pakistan and looking at the serious research done in this area. Of course, that includes uh, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, um, partly my home for my own PhD research, UNFPA, Population Council of Pakistan, Population Association of Pakistan, Gates Foundation, Aga Khan University, University of Peshawar, University of Karachi, Qadi Azam, uh, Lahore School of e Economics, Lahore College of Education for Women, Government College, and of course, FCCU. Uh, my apologies, of course, if I've forgotten somebody, but I think one of the great things uh, of this Zoom era is to be able to bring so many people together like this. Of course, the topic of today's discussion is also timely, simultaneously being a matter of both interest and concern. I look back and think, uh, this is earlier than most people here, but I was born in Pakistan in 1957. The population of Pakistan, West Pakistan at the time was 42 million people. By the time I left Pakistan for my university education in the US in 1975, the country had a population of 66 million people. Uh, I returned 10 years later to start my career as a USAID officer. Uh, at that time, the population had climbed to 92 million people. And of course, now it is approaching 220 million people. Another very startling factoid, in fact, I wonder if there's some people around this uh, table that could perhaps uh, say that this is a wrong statistic because it hardly seems possible to me. But in 1971, um, you look at East Pakistan about to become Bangladesh, it has a population of 65 million people, West Pakistan at the time, 60 million people. Five million more people in East Pakistan than West Pakistan, five million more people in, in Bangladesh than in, 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 in Pakistan. And of course, now that difference is tens of millions. And it's sort of the, I use this in a policy sense because small, seemingly small policy changes over a certain period in time, over a long time, have significant impact. They also have generational impact in terms of the prospects of, 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 new, of, of new generations. Uh, and so again, I think that puts a real onus on policy, but also academics that inform that policy and how those small changes can change trajectories over time. Uh, against that backdrop, no wonder that the phrase population explosion is used as the title for some of the presentations we'll hear later today, focused specifically on Pakistan. Although I have to think if there was a similar uh, symposium taking place uh, in, in, in India or China, the discussion would actually be fairly, uh, fairly different. Uh, for India, one milestone is that the demographic transition is certainly taking place. I don't know if many people saw it in the newspapers, but last week the National Family Health Survey undertaken by the Ministry of Health suggested that the country's total fertility rate had dropped to two, which of course is less than replacement level. While India is still expected to overtake China as the most populous country in the world, Relatively soon, it will now take a bit longer with the country's population now at 1.4 billion and expected to stabilize by around 1.6 billion in 2050. Contraceptive prevalence in India stands at 65%. And I think another interesting statistic is that the percentage of women wanting to use birth control but are unable to access it continues to decline. Of course, figures vary between regions and demographic groups, uh, but it does appear that uh, India is no longer experienced what might be used to be called in their case, a population explosion. As for China, uh, and again, some people may be able to offer later new information on this, but birth rates there continue to hit record lows. In fact, at 8.5 births per thousand, the birth rate is lower than it has ever been since the Chinese revolution in the late forties. 12 million babies were born in China in 2020, an 18.5% decline from the 14.6 born in 2019. And yet looking ahead to this year, 
that number 12 million, which might seem low, is gonna probably be around 10 million uh, for 2021. Uh, in fact, China's fertility rate of 1.3 uh, per female is among the lowest in the world, even lower than Japan, uh, even though China's per capita income is less than a fourth that of Japan. Again, if a symposium like this were being held in China, it might focus on different kinds of issues, including possibly a precipitous decline. Uh, I was reading actually very recently in the case of China that um, uh, in the coming years, 200 million uh, Chinese will go into retirement, even, uh, even as there will be 200 million less in the workforce. And you think about that, that's an, a population equivalent to Pakistan. So again, uh, looking at the demographic changes there and the types of discussion, Pakistan does face uh, its own issues. In fact, of course, every country faces its own challenge and its own unique social, cultural, political, and economic circumstances. And Pakistan's issues are certainly quite different now than in India, China, or even in Bangladesh. So looking at today, the focus is appropriately on Pakistan with a view toward taking an important, and I might say vital, deep dive into one of the big issues facing the country, the increasingly unusual case of a country that continues to grow, rapidly placing enormous stress on its social and economic system, while perhaps providing certain opportunities as well as lessons learned from the experiences of others. Uh, and I might say, I think, uh, I forget who mentioned the, the demographic di dividend. That still actually is a live possibility for Pakistan if it gets it right. And it'd be very interesting to, uh, you know, to see how that happens. And again, I think this informed uh, research uh, that can guide policy is an important part of that. So once again, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this opening session and provide a few reflections. Uh, some of them, I think, may be deepened and perhaps uh, even say, what, what was he saying when he said that? Uh, but I, I, again, I look forward to the high quality of the discussion that follows, of the uh, presentation that follows, and certainly wish you all the best as you continue this discussion on this hugely important topic throughout the rest of the day. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Edelton, for these most informative and encouraging comments. I would now like to commence the panel discussion by inviting our chair for the panel, Dr. Zeba Sattar. Dr. Zeba Sattar is a senior associate and directs the Population Council's office in Islamabad, Pakistan, overseeing technical assistance and capacity building, social science research and population and demographic dividend research that informs national policy discussions and development. Her expertise include cross-national comparative research, advocacy for policy change, analysis of demographic trends and patterns, and evaluation of health service delivery systems. Dr. Sattar has a PhD in medical demography from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She received the Tamgai Imtiaz Award in 2006 by President of Pakistan in recognition of her extraordinary services in the development sector. Dr. Zeba Sita, I invite you to please share your thoughts with us. Thank you. I, I do bring back lots of memories to see such familiar faces. And yet uh, we also have to focus on the huge challenge, which remains almost similar to what it was 30, 40 years ago. Um, I want a little bit, uh, I want to acknowledge that FCCU um, was selected from a long list when the Population Council was tasked by UNFPA to set up a, a population research center. And it was top of the selection, uh, mainly because, uh, not because I knew Dr. Jonathan Adelton would later uh, be his, his director there, but because it possessed all the qualities that we were looking for. Population and development and population growth are not just about fertility, fam planning, and not just a job for demographers. And I think that you have, and as we see on the program, many people from FCCU and the linkages you have are really the basis of that selection. Since then, UNFP and Population Council have also included Peshawar University an IBA, um, and I hope in the next event that we can actually have like a combined seminar. But I'm delighted to see such a, a galaxy of stars here today um, and uh, from many other disciplines. And the fact that even from Dr. Kandar Hayat, again, a colleague who I uh, knew when I was at Pied and he was at Haid Azam University, we both young uh, researchers returning with PhDs that you mentioned you know, the, the linkages, the linkages are so broad with migration, 
health, gender, and I really like your emphasis on gender, malnutrition, the green economy, and of course, aging, which perhaps we don't worry about enough, but will come upon us soon. Um, I, Dr. Vakas, some initial slides that would kick off um, my presentation, and then I will introduce subsequent speakers, um, you know, starting with Dr. Gavin Jones, Professor Fong, uh, Dr. GM Arif, and Dr. Minhaj Khadwai. But uh, I'd just like to share a few slides to not talk about the global context, but maybe Pakistan and the South Asian context. So um, if you allow me to share my screen, I've never, by the way, um, Oh, I see. So you've disabled uh, screen sharing, so I can't um, actually do this. Um, if you allow me to share my screen, that would be great. Uh, I should have really, okay, thank you. <clears throat> right. okay. So uh, I want to do this in slideshow, so. Oh, well, um, I don't think this is working for me. Uh, I wanted to do the slideshow, but I'll, unfortunately, I'll have to go through it this way. Um, so as the world enters uh, a phase of much slower population growth, um, as pointed out by uh, Dr. Sikandar Hayat, uh, Pakistan continues amongst very few countries in the world to still have a growth rate of over 2%. And we see multiple threats facing us uh, from the economy, uh, to the polity, to national stability, uh, some of the solutions. So um, let me just set the context. Uh, um, we all know. I mean, a lot of the demographers, and I apologize for going back, and you know, all nations will converge eventually to from high uh, fertility and mortality to low fertility and low mortality and experience replacement and fertility, such was, uh, and, and of course, uh, indeed, stabilization. And while this happened in Latin America in the 70s and 80s, uh, in, even in South Asia, this change to happen, the demographic transition expected to happen over about 20 to 30 years. And in, in bold, I just uh, highlight what is so different playing uh, challenge in the 90s um, that it has been slow since then. It has staggered. And intersensal growth rate, we were really actually quite shocked with the intersensal growth rate from 1998 to 2017 being as high as 2.4%. And the fact that our fertility is still so high. Um, and I think what we would like to see is more analysis going forward by young researchers about what, what, what is important, what will give, what will make, break past trends. So, uh, um, uh, I did, did promise that I would just try to set Pakistan's population. You know, we have uh, the best intersensal growth rate. Perhaps the actual in annual increase is probably more like 2% or slightly shy of that. But contrast it to the 1% um, particularly in had experience uh, some problems in terms of the northern states uh, coming down um, in their fertility, but has caught up now. Um, and you can see that here, Pakistan in green had started experience, not that none was expecting you, did not happen. And I think that for us is the troubling part uh, of Pakistan's demographic transition. So um, 
what are when we analyze what other south asian countries um unfortunately i didn't really uh, include sri lanka in many of these slides and we didn't have data on pakistan sri lanka because it's so compared um, you know about 39 per thousand even in a place like bangladesh and age at marriage is much higher so um, only about 18% of girls aged 20 young women 20 24 are married by the age of 18 in pakistan compared to 51% in bangladesh so all kinds of anomalies underlie this but uh we go further and we say well let's explore what are the explanations basically um um you know what is different again and what is similar is it that we are poorer is our uh, economy not growing as fast well you can see from the green line again that we were at a huge advantage uh, dr adelton talked about the 80s and particularly because of the remittances and boom in growth etc oil prices so we did experience a huge rise in our economic growth uh, till about 2000 uh, the you've still been growing but not maybe at such a rapid speed and leveling off after about 2015 um and so it's not that our gdp is lag far behind though of course bangladesh as you pointed has surpassed and for many many reasons and one of them being really um little changes or other important changes in policy um export led uh, growth and of course the decline in rapid population growth rates um is it that we lack in infrastructure not really uh, i think we're pretty good in terms of infrastructure i mean the sanitation is pretty much one of the highest electrification is one of the highest the highest in south asia and we are the most uh, or were at least one of the most urbanized uh, with bangladesh and um, india also catching up now uh, with levels of urbanization and urbanization that you was mentioned i think particularly by dr sekandar hayat we may be undercounting it uh, would uh, lead you a priority to expect a highly urbanizing country with rapid internal migration from rural to urban areas to in fact experience uh, earlier um, fertility decline but in fact that has not happened another puzzle that i wish that um, a lot of scholars here would really take up the links between urbanization migration and uh, reproductive behavior human development uh, when we start looking at human development that's where the the, the answers start coming out human development indeed has been slow um this human development index uh, of course comprises three measures of education gdp per capita and um, and health so let us look at those individually well uh, i've already showed you the gdp but childhood mortality i think another clue lies in the fact that whereas mortality decline overall mortality decline um the childhood mortality rates particularly the neonatal mortality rate in pakistan has really been stubborn to change and i think there lies one of the keys to why parents and their demand for children may not have changed because they do experience high levels of loss of children uh, at early ages um even as young as one month especially um but i would like to emphasize that if there was one that i would pick i would say uh, that would drive a lot of the others is really women's autonomy even i was shocked when i saw compared this world bank data that pakistan scores about the levels of afghanistan 35.8 in a women's autonomy Video. so this this is really a uh, very very another clue that women in pakistan somehow have just um, not achieved autonomy and i think one of the measures is really um, 
mobility. And I think that is something that strikes a lot of people when they come to Pakistan, limited mobility of Pakistani women and girls. Um, and of course, female education and labor force participation are routes to increasing women's autonomy. And you can see that literacy rates are much lower. And the labor force participation is another area of research that I would really encourage. It's generally low in South Asia, with the exception of Nepal. Even India has only a 21% labor force, and Pakistan is slightly, slightly higher. But we cannot talk about demographic dividends without this um, figure being higher. Women have to be more, uh, participate more in the labor force. And there are structural, we say there are cultural reasons, but they're more structural than cultural, uh, I would say. Um, last, uh, in terms of explanations, is the FAM planning program. We claim the, one of the oldest programs, but I would also say now we claim one of the weakest programs uh, that for uh, FAM planning. And again, there are more structural reasons. Uh, we made a population welfare department, whereas uh, almost every country in the world works through health. And I think it's a question of the fact that we spend barely 35 cents. That's uh, the latest analysis. 35 cents, about uh, 80 rupees or so, um, you know, I'm sorry, it's even less than that, uh, per person in Pakistan on, on family planning services alone. So if you spend little, the level of effort as seen is in all these areas of data, quality, accountability, equity, uh, very poor level of effort, of course, you don't get the results. So we may have policies, we don't seem to be too bad in the strategy area, policies, but implementation is really weak. So I'll end my presentation by quickly going through what will give. Well, I don't think, uh, even if I hope that our economy does better than it, has now, it is doing now, um, that it would actually really drive contraception and fertility. Um, globally, I don't think that we found that that GDP is particularly a driver of demographic change. Um, and even here, the chart shows that though Pakistan is much lower in contraceptive prevalence and higher in total fertility rates, that this will actually change things. So of course, a rise in the economic rates will definitely provide other levers will, that will change things. To me, the key lies in women's empowerment. Um, I've already dwelt on that and on improving the, the family planning effort more broadly through health. Um, through better campaigns, through more services, through the private sector, and particularly the departments of health, and through better financing. So to conclude, I think um, Pakistan's pathway, uh, you know, in ways we are becoming more divergent than convergent, which, uh, you know, really in terms of a comparison with the other South Asian fertility, but we may actually be converging more with West Asia. So, um, you know, it's, it's not that every, every country has to. But in terms of our own predictions, uh, John Kasslein and myself did a study in 2001, as did many people at that time. We really thought we were on our way towards catching up in terms of the fertility transition, but it did not happen. And largely we uh, made it contingent on a downward trend in demand for children, which didn't happen and an expansion in services, which also didn't happen. Um, I think Pakistani women have high unmet need, but are disavowed to make decisions. And sometimes they just lack physical access. Um, so not sometimes, most times. Um, and I think a breakthrough in terms of current trends would be immediately possible if we have game-changing programs. And we have many pilots that show that a rise uh, of girls' education, because there's a demand for girls' education. There's a demand for female employment that is untapped as there is a demand for a fertility transition. Um, so I think all these changes uh, can happen quite easily. So um, I'll stop sharing here if I can hopefully do that. Yes, I can. And come back to uh, thank you for allowing me this time and to launch this wonderful panel. Um, I would like to now, um, you know, introduce this, the, the a very, very eminent um, speaker, first, uh, second speaker, who is uh, Professor Gavin Jones. Um, as Dr. Adelton said, everyone who has ever, I think, um, worked in demography has come across the work of Dr. Jones, who's an emeritus uh, professor at the Australian National University. 
He completed his PhD degree in demography uh, from, uh, from the ANU in, and uh, has conducted research on a wide range of topics, focusing particularly on low fertility regimes in Asia, delayed marriage, urbanization, and equity aspects of education. Um, there are many, many journal articles and books to his name. Um, I want to acknowledge that I, his, um, my master's thesis was practically based on his work um, and led me to work at Pied um, because it was done um, somehow and, and that's how I actually traced his work. More recently, he has worked on the political economy analysis of Pakistan's population issues and on the Pakistan situation analysis, uh, both through United Nations Population Fund. So over to you, Dr. Ja Gavin Jones, for your contribution this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. And um, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Zeba Sata, my, my old friend, and um, for your very kind words. Um, it's always a, a an, both an honor and a pleasure to participate in discussions on population policy uh, issues in, in Pakistan. And I, I really uh, look forward to the possibility of presenting a few thoughts uh, today. Of course, 20 minutes is not very long and um, there is a lot to, to discuss, but uh, happily Dr. Sattar has already presented some very important uh, information which can, can shorten the uh, presentation perhaps of myself and, and, and some others. Uh, next, please. Um, I, I, I think it's very striking that, uh, that there's been a major change in, 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 in governmental and, and attitudes towards population at the senior levels of government uh, in Pakistan. Uh, some years ago, you know, it was very striking that uh, nobody in the highest positions of power was willing to say that population, rapid population growth is, is a major issue. And of course that changed and, that, and at the highest levels of government population issue is now considered very important. Um, it's agreed that pop rapid population growth is an obstacle to achieving Pakistan's goals of sustained human and economic development. It's agreed that lowered fertility will lead to obviously slower population growth and beneficial changes in age structure, generally referred to as the demographic dividend. I'm not going to be saying much about the demographic dividend in my presentation, but uh, I know that other speakers will be, so I will leave it to them. Just to, to mention that the National Task Force uh, appointed at the highest level of government, the action plan uh, aims to reduce population growth rate from 2.4% to 1.5% per annum by 2024 and 1.1% per annum by 2030. Uh, the mechanism is uh, contraceptive prevalence rate raised from 34% to 50% and then to 60% by 2030. And the uh, outcome is expected to be a total fertility rate lowered from 3.6 to 2.8 by 2025 and 2.2 by 2030. Now, actually, you know, if you look at that 2.2 goal for 2030, that's a very, very optimistic uh, target. And yet it, it is important that it be reached because uh, as, uh, uh, as previous uh, speakers have already mentioned, Dr. Uh, Adult and uh, Dr. Zabasata, the, the population growth rate in Pakistan is extremely rapid. Um, and Pakistan is really an outlier in, in this respect. And um, that is not, that does not have good implications for Pakistan's future. Uh, next, please. Next slide, thank you. Um, so Pakistan lags compared to countries in key development indicators. I'll just mention briefly a few of them. Um, the under five mortality rate, the infant mortality rate and the early childhood mortality rate, they're double that of Bangladesh and um, India and triple those of Indonesia and Egypt. And uh, as Dr. Sattar already mentioned, this, undoubtedly affects people's um, 
thinking about the need to have more children. There's an uncertainty about child survival, which is uh, which is still uh, very important in uh, Pakistan. Uh, another key indicator is the net enrolment rate in secondary education, and that one is almost half that of Bangladesh and less than half that of Indonesia and Egypt. And, you know, we stress girls' education, and that is extremely important, but I think it's also worth mentioning that in, in Pakistan, boys' education is also lagging badly at the secondary level. So while it's very important to raise girls' education, it is also important to, uh, to raise boys' education at the same time. Um, on the female labor force participation rate, Pakistan's not so low compared to, uh, it's not low compared to India, but India is also very low and, and has fallen in recent years. Um, but um, Pakistan's uh, participation rate is well below Bangladesh and far below countries like China, Indonesia and Southeast Asian countries generally. Next, please. Next. <clears throat> Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, no, 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 back to the uh, broad concerns. Uh, yeah. So it's agreed that there's a need to lower fertility in Pakistan and that the um, I issue is urgent. The national narrative on population growth issued by the government of Pakistan states that Pakistan must lose no further time in achieving a rate of population growth that is sustainable. This will have to be much lower than the rate of 2.4% over the 1998 to 2017 period. But in considering how to proceed, we need to take a broad perspective on the issues. A number of factors must be considered. Why, for example, has human development lagged in Pakistan? Certainly not because of any lack of potential among Pakistan's young people. Then there is the issue of elite capture. Uh, elite capture issues stressed in government documents and by the World Bank continue to hinder Pakistan's efforts to achieve more rapid economic and social development. Uh, what is this elite capture? It's control of institutions to serve the narrow interests of the powerful interest groups, insider groups, while they fail to provide universal opportunities for socioeconomic development to the large disadvantaged groups. Good governments and focused policy on human development and poverty alleviation is key to achieving the goals of population policy. And then inadequate attention has been paid to the basic needs of health care and education. If we look at government budgets, uh, for example, the, uh, the share of uh, government revenues going into education and health is, is low, and it's much lower than it uh, should be. And that's why Pakistan is trailing so many other countries in these respects, aside from the issue of the, the, the rapid growth in the population that's being served. So Pakistanis continue to prefer families of, of three or four children. That's another broad concern. And this must be taken uh, into account in a rights-based approach to population and family planning issues. Next, please. Next, next slide, please. So if we compare the uh, data from a number of demographic and health surveys. Uh, I've put here Pakistan, Indonesia, Nepal, and Bangladesh. Um, the percent of women who want no more children, according to the number of living children, um, I've just put those for living children uh, one, two, three, and four. But if you look at uh, that column of no, number of living children, two, Indonesia, Nepal, and Bangladesh, uh, two thirds or more of uh, women don't want any more children. In Pakistan, only 20% who don't want any more children. And for three children, uh, not quite as wide a gap, but again, enormous uh, differences between the share of those in Pakistan who don't want more children and the share of those in these other countries. So, 
I should mention that in Pakistan, there's a fairly large group of women who give a don't know answer to that question. So, you know, probably in, in actual fact, the number who don't want more might be higher than is shown in that table. But even so, it's very clear that it's, uh, it's very much um, uh, different from a number of other countries. And of course, the uh, stress of the United Nations and other groups is that, um, you know, you must respect people's demand for children. You should not be uh, uh, interfering with that. So next slide, please. Uh, so what then should be the approach to the agreed need to lower fertility? And I, I would suggest that the following four pronged approach, which is totally in line with a rights based approach to family planning is what needs to be followed. Uh, first of all, lower the infant and early childhood mortality rate. Uh, second, raise education levels of both boys and girls. Uh, third, focus on countering gender inequality and opening wider employment opportunities for Pakistan's increasingly well educated women. And I believe these two strategies are likely to lead to lower desired family size. And, and finally, meet the unmet need for family planning, because although I stress that, you know, a, a lot of uh, people are, are wanting to continue having more children, uh, there is a substantial unmet need for family planning. Uh, that is those uh, who don't want uh, more children, or at least at the moment, or ever, and uh, are not using family planning. So uh, that one, of course, needs to be met. Now, these four prongs have many beneficial results, aside from their role in lowering fertility, and are in line with stated national development goals. Uh, for example, increased female labour force participation will not only make a clear contribution to economic growth, but will also help to slow population growth through backward and forward linkages. Next slide, please. So the key assumption is that bringing Pakistan to a situation where the majority of women have good educational and employment opportunities will lead to a decline in desired family size because it broadens women's opportunities beyond the traditional role of bearing and rearing children and will lead to a desire to give better opportunities to fewer children. This is the typical result of such developments in many countries. And the, the point is that mass education changes society, not just its individual members. It can lead to ideational changes in society as a whole, moving society toward an industrial, urbanized, monetized economy with lower community childbearing norms. And it also leads to higher age of marriage for women and greater female autonomy. Next, please. Now, the issue of how can contraceptive prevalence uh, be raised? First of all, the, the first two points are really to do with the demand side. Um, the contraceptive prevalence rate of modern methods is less than half that in Bangladesh, Indonesia, or Egypt. That's an extraordinary difference when you look at it. And when you compare it with other data for other countries around the world, the contraceptive prevalence rate in, in Pakistan is really uh, surprisingly low. Although demand, a desired family size remains fairly high in Pakistan, there is a substantial unmet need for family planning, as uh, already mentioned. So those are the sort of demand side issues. On the supply side, the uh, sorry, also on the uh, demand side, the demand will increase further if the four-pronged approach mentioned earlier is followed, I believe. Um, but on the supply side, we have obstacles there to raising the prevalence of contraception. Uh, next, please. Next slide. Um, challenges in providing contraceptive services. Um, there, are, there are many issues here, and I'll just touch on a couple. Uh, uh, many people uh, participating in this conference um, are well aware of the issues involved. Um, there's the issue of the roles of the public and private sectors. The, the private sector has not been engaged to the extent that it needs to be in provision of uh, uh, 
uh, family planning services. Then there's the issue of the need for more effective coordination between the Department of Health and the Department of Population Welfare. The Department of Health has many more outlets uh, and resources for the provision of uh, family planning services than the Department of Population Welfare, but it has not tended to give great priority to this uh, uh, provision in its overall view of its role in providing health services, and that, uh, and that needs to change. Uh, the need to ensure effective utilisation of uh, lady health workers in provision of family planning advice and services. LHW has had a major role in the past uh, in, in providing family planning advice and services and then their work was somewhat diluted because they were given additional responsibilities and there were some other issues as well. So that there is a need now to refocus very much the uh, LHW's uh, uh, focus on family planning as, as a key, uh, perhaps the key element of their work. Uh, um, and finally, every opportunity must be seized to provide family planning information and if required services to women in their encounters with the health system. Um, women have encounters with the health system of many kinds and um, studies show that uh, there's not very much uh, um, use being made of these encounters to provide them with information uh, 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 about family planning. Next, please. So mutually reinforcing interactions, the policies in, uh, advocated in the four-pronged approach will be mutually reinforcing, follow, follow, lowering the average number of children couples want and enabling them to raise their children without contending with unintended pregnancies. And I just give a couple of examples of, of these kinds of interactions. Raising the levels of female education will contribute to lowering infant and early childhood mortality. Making family planning services readily available will lower unwanted fertility and facilitate birth spacing and health, hence lower the high rates of infant and child mortality related to frequent and unwanted births and lowered child mortality and ill health will free up mother's time for other things, including better caring for other children and joining the workforce. Next, please. So turning to the, uh, the key opportunities, um, it's easy to take a pessimistic view of uh, Pakistan's prospects, but I would prefer to take a positive view uh, on, on these prospects for particularly those for achieving the population policy goals, while recognizing that the, uh, that the obstacles are, are very great. Um, if the demographic transition can be uh, accelerated, this will yield the potential demographic dividend. Achieving the SDGs, and of course, Pakistan government has been giving considerable attention to that uh, need. Uh, these are interrelated and success will be reinforcing and will facilitate the deceleration of population growth. And then of course, the s -House program has the potential to improve the circumstances of the most disadvantaged sections of the community. <clears throat> Next, please. And this is um, this is my final uh, slide. The population policy must adopt an integrated, multi-sectoral approach, fully integrated with within comprehensive socio-economic development plans. It should focus on efficient investments in education, especially at the secondary level, health and skills development ensure equitable distribution of socioeconomic opportunities, promote export-led growth backed by private and public sector investment in the manufacturing sector to produce quality jobs demanding middle and higher skills. Effective population policy will achieve desired outcomes, including higher contraceptive uptake and lower fertility rates. And finally, it cannot be stressed enough that achieving these outcomes will depend on concurrent adoption of economic and social policies that reduce the exclusion of the marginalized population from socioeconomic opportunities. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gavin Jones. I'm sure um, there was a lot of uh, a lot of thoughts, a lot of suggestions, a lot of analysis to absorb. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think that we will move from analysis of Pakistan's population challenges to uh, actually looking at another demographic phenomena that is really becoming more and more important, always has been um, migration. And uh, we have with us Dr. Eric Fong, who will be looking at migration opportunities and challenges, migration amongst East and Southeast Asian economies. Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Fong to you. Um, he is at the University of Hong Kong, um, and he moved there from the Chinese University of Hong Kong um, and where he served as chair of the Department of Sociology and in the inaugural director of Research Center on Migration and Mobility. Prior to returning to Hong Kong in 2016, Dr. Fong has been a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto for more than 20 years. He was also Cheng Xiang, the chair um, professor at Z University and uh, formerly served as the president of the Canadian Population Society, the North American Chinese Sociologists Association as well. Um, so I, 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 his latest book is with Brent Barry on immigration and the city and was published by Polity Press in 2017. Uh, welcome Dr. Fong and we really look forward to your uh, refreshing East Asian uh, international perspective on migration. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sahab. That very kind of, um, of your nice um, introduction. And also, thank you so much for inviting me to present in this so important conference and about the population growth. And i um, glad to see some friends online, finally. And hopefully, um, we will have a chance to meet in person very soon. Um, I think everyone hope that. Um, today, because what we are going to talk about is about migration, I guess it's also is about physical mobility. Um, so what I'm going to discuss about is the, um, the migration issues in, in East and Southeast Asia. So let me just first share the, the screen with you all. Okay, um, all right, so, um, so today what I'm going to talk about is the, um, to give you a broad overview about the migration issues in East and Southeast Asian economies. And I would like to bring out some um, observations that related to, to the opportunity as well as challenges. As all we know that migration also is one of the tools or some uh, another um, possibility that um, help to sustain the population growth. So when I referring to the, um, the, the region of East and Southeast Asia, basically I follow the, uh, the United Nations um, um, definition of the, the region that include a number of um, places. And um, we, what we are talking about in this region, we are talking about 2.3 billion population and it consists of about 32% of the world population, at least in 2015. And when we talk about this region, of course, we understand that this region um, has a, a quite diverse historical and uh, ethnocultural background. So, and of, of course, it's also, um, they have different um, political evolution and also different um, uh, stages of economic development. So I guess it's something that we need to bear in mind when we talk about this particular region. We are not talking about a homogeneous, um, um, region, but with um, a lot of the, the differences. So um, when we talk about the, um, the migration in East and Southeast Asia, very different from um, the, the literature, mainly focusing on the, the, um, the North America and the European um, context. Um, they are mainly focusing on the immigrants that moving from, um, from one place to um, Europe, um, to North America, to Australia, to settle down there. But when we talk about migration in East and Southeast Asia, mainly we are talking about the, the migrant work, the people uh, moving from one place to another um, to work. But why does occur? 
Um, the meaning is because um, uh, East and Southeast Asia has experienced a rapid economic growth, and at the same time, uh, a rapid uh, integration of the region in the last 40 years. And so they gradually integrate into a global value change that increased the interdependency among all nations uh, in the region. And so therefore we see a number of uh, multilateral agreements among these places in the region, for example, the WTO Information Technology Agreement, which encouraged the international accords, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation, um, a lot of us are familiar with the ASEAN, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, APEC. So a lot of this international um, organization actually helped to promote um, the integration of the region. And so therefore we see that many places began to recruit workers in the, I would say that in the last um, 40 to 50 years, and mainly a lot of um, these places, they recruit um, many low skilled worker from other places. Um, they, a lot of time they target a specific industry such as um, the, the domestic worker. I think a lot of study have been on this particular group. Um, Korea, for example, they started to recruit the, um, some of the, um, the workers so-called from the, from the industrial and technical training program uh, for trainees and the employment pro permit programs uh, for the worker. For example, even Japan um, in recent years, they started to have the technical uh, intern training program, the TITP, that started in 1994, and then also adopted flexible new visa category to bring in foreign workers. But why there's so many places in East and Southeast Asia, they recruit the, um, the workers um, to their place because um, one of the reason, I guess, is um, the aging issue. The, um, what um, uh, Ga um, Gavin Jones mentioned about the ultra no uh, fertility rate. And also because um, there are more uh, female, lab higher female labor force participation. So therefore they need someone uh, at home to take care of their family as the, the female enter the labor force. Um, but then at the same time, there are some places they place an effort to recruit high skill worker. Say for example, Hong Kong um, implement a number of programs such as the quality migrant admission scheme and the admission scheme for mainland talents and professional, they target um, the high skill worker. In Singapore, um, in particular, they adopt a more liberal immigration policy for skilled worker, which facilitate the path to permanent residency and citizenship and implement a various program such as a company grant scheme to reduce the cost of employing skilled foreign worker and the housing scheme to address the skilled worker needs for short-term accommodation. So Singapore make a big effort to recruit um, high skilled worker um, to the city. Um, and so therefore we see that um, the, um, a lot of places in uh, East and Southeast Asia, they compete with high skilled and highly educated uh, migrant. Um, at the same time, not only uh, a lot of the, the places they recruit, um, no matter how, no skill or high skill worker, we also see many places they promote out migration of workers. Say for example, the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration in 1982 firmly institutionalized um, the country macroeconomic strategy of exporting labor. Um, similarly, Vietnamese, um, Vietnam, the Vietnamese labor working abroad under the labor contract in 2003 and revised in 2006. And, and at, at the same time, the some country, they actively, they coordinate policy so that the, the remittance from citizens working abroad promote the home country economic growth. Say, for example, the Philippine government designed a number of bilateral agreement with labor receiving country to further control the framework of working condition for Filipino workers overseas. So all this effort, not just only to promote um, their citizen to work overseas, but at the same time to, to protect the well-being when they work overseas. So in Indonesia and other major labor sending country, the state began to administer the placement of labor in overseas destination in 1969. In 1970, with the enactment of government regulation number four, um, which is about um, in Philippines, which introduced the interprovincial labor for, um, placement and the international labor place.
placement program. So the private sector became involved in the recruitment and placement of migrants. So why this is the case? Um, we see that well. I'm also in, in the in the 19, in, in the 2000s, a series of regulation also an act to protect Indonesian migrant worker abroad. So um, so we see that um, with the increasing intensity of international economic linkage, many countries in East and Southeast Asia have become simultaneously they send and also they receive. Um, they have become descending and receiving country of um, migrant um, and most of whom some worker. And we see that this is the setting is very different from those we find in the literature based on the experience of European and North American country, which are typically immigrant receiving country and the migrant they receive are diverse in background. Because the majority of international migrants in East and Southeast Asia are from the same region, the visible racial difference has not been a major focus uh, in the mi migrant adaptation literature in the region. So what we suggested that here, when you think about East and East Asian um, migration um, study, um, so I think something we need to pay attention to is to look at the migration flow, including the circular migration that they um, worker, they move back and forth, um, onward migration, um, they move from one place to another, the stepwise migration, they move from one place to another, but eventually they have some final destination in mind. And also, um, we also need to pay attention to the, the migrant background um, because nowadays a lot of city looking at the low skill uh, migrant, but of course they, we also see growing um, number of the high skill migrant. And I think that's something we need to pay more attention to. And at the same time, I guess is um, the, we also, we understand that when we think about the migrant workers, um, of course, the integration pattern will be very much different than the, the integration pattern. We are quite familiar that um, based on the literature um, that um, looking at the migration issues in um, North America, in Europe, and in Australia. So what are the consequences of migration in East and Southeast Asia? First of all, of course, it's related to the, um, the, um, the, labor, um, the local labor market. So existing study are largely based on, we know that based on official report by various government agency or international non-government agency. So all this kind of study are relatively descriptive in nature with limited statistical analysis to isolate and to, and to test the theoretical relationship between migration and specific aspect of development. So what I can say that at this point, I think most of the study are quite um, preliminary and we only have some very um, descriptive information about the, the, the consequences. Um, and, but then we find that there are some study that provide a little bit more um, 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 multivariate analysis. For example, a study in Thailand, they find that the presence of low skill migrant worker increased the productivity of high skill native worker. Um, and, but then in, in the context of highly regulated management of migration uh, in the region of East and Southeast Asia, um, there is a little room for no skill foreign worker for negotiation or bargaining with the employer suggesting that the effect of migration on the labor market is minimal. So we see that um, sometimes the study suggested that there was a strong impact. Sometimes we see that there is um, not so much impact. So the finding seems to be quite mixed. The second um, um, area that I think uh, a lot of people are very much interest, uh, interested in is about the remittance. So um, study on the impact of remittance have document that in East and Southeast Asian country, the poverty gap has reduced when a large proportion of city uh, citizens are working overseas. About 96.2% of all overseas workers from the Philippines, um, they are contract worker. And they estimate, according to Philippine Statistic Authority, they collect the data every year. The total remittance in 2018, for example, was about 43.6 million peso and about 26% cash. And remittance also important in Indonesia. Um, the amount of remittance from Indonesia foreign workers and half of them they are working in Asia was about 9 billion in US dollar in 2017. So you can see the, the huge remittance that's sending back um, of the workers back to their home country. 
And remittance from migrant worker can improve the family's economic resources considerably and sometimes shift um, them from relying solely on agriculture to establishing petty um, business. And some of the sending home remittance money, they usually um, use for three purposes, financial capital investment, human capital formation, and social accumulation, capital accumulation. So when we, we, when we talk about capital investment, they range from direct bank deposit, very simple, just deposit the money to the bank, or sometimes financial investment. When we think about the human capital formation, they usually, they use the money to provide education to their children, or sometimes the healthcare of the family member. When we think about, when we talk about the social capital accumulation of this remittance, um, it's used to support friends and relatives. Um, so we can see that the remittance are quite important um, to the uh, migrant workers' family back home. So, um, and also there are some study about the, um, another consequence of the, the, um, the migration in East and Southeast Asia is about uh, the children left behind. And, and a lot of study about the psychological well-being of children left behind. Um, some of them, they suggest there's a negative effect. Some of them, they suggested that no effect. Um, but then they also suggested that not only this, um, they have also, um, um, the, even though their psychological well-being being affected, but then most of them, they agree that the material circumstances have been improved. But also, they also um, um, find that um, the, the father role has been changed. Um, they also not only, you know, the, the caregiving function or seek help from, ex, they, they provide caregiving function. And sometimes if they cannot, they seek help from the extended family member. Um, but then you know, when we talk about all this, um, we know that when, you know, during the COVID-19, um, the migrate, I, I would say that um, a lot of the um, uh, flow from one country to another has been virtually stopped. And of course, that also some of the migrant workers or the, the worker um, travel to in other places, they also under tremendous um, constraint. So under the COVID-19, I think there's um, a, a number of issues that uh, people started to pay attention to, um, the protection of the citizen in overseas that of course related to the human right issue and also the reduction of taking new jobs because um, um, a lot of the, the constraint that imposed by many countries that not allow people to enter their place, um, their country. So it, it suggested that reduction of the remittance back home. And also because of the traveling restriction or the, or the um, quarantine. So um, the, the migrant workers, they lacking of opportunity to visit home. So in other words, they have major implication to um, um, the children left behind and also the couple relation, um, the, the relationship uh, uh, between the couples. Um, so we would suggest that at the same time, when we think about the migration in East and Southeast Asia, I, um, a lot of time we're lacking of detailed surveys data so that allow us to um, have some hypothesis testing and model building. And also we are lacking a theoretical model to explain migration in East and Southeast Asia. Um, it's challenging because I think um, the, the context is very different from most of the migration literature. We usually read um, about the, um, again, it's about the, um, in Europe and North America and, and, and Australia. Um, the reason is because usually um, we are talking about um, the migration from the same, um, uh, sometimes the same ethnic group, but then at least the, the same racial group. Um, we're talking about a large number of them are migrant worker and a, a high proportion of female migration and people moving in and moving out. And, but then I think it's also quite important that we are lacking of the comparative work in the region um, not just only within the region, but with other regions as well, such as for um, the comparative work with the, the South Asia. And I think that um, there's a lot of com um, comparison um, work can be developed between the two regions, the East and Southeast Asia um, with the South, um, so South Asia. And I hope that through this um, discussion, um, there are more um, work um, can be um, uh, foster um, to develop some kind of comparative work um, to look at the, the two regions. So I'm going to stop here and welcome for the discussion or um, question um, later in our Q&A time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fong. And I think there will be a lot of questions um, and I think an opportunity for 
um, some comparison when Dr. Nasr Shah will also speak about international labor migration. Um, and we have a quick Q&A for about 20, 30 minutes, hopefully uh, at the end of, uh, you know, after our next two speakers. But thank you very much. That was really, really very interesting. Um, now I'd like to invite Dr. <coughs> Ghulam Mohammed Arif, um, who's a, a longtime colleague from PIDE and we continue to work together. Um, he's going to be talking about international internal migration patterns in Pakistan and its, their implications for socioeconomic development. Uh, Dr. G.M. Arif is the president of the Population Association of Pakistan. Um, he has completed his, both his PhD and um, MA degree from Australian National University. You can see a lot of uh, people from ANU um, on, this, on this panel. Um, he is the former joint director of the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, where he spent most of his career, but I know he's also worked for the Asian Development Bank and published extensively uh, on migration, on population trends, um, you know, and on labor force issues, on poverty issues. Um, we are really, uh, he's one of Pakistan's, if not the, uh, at the moment, leading uh, demographers. Over to you, Dr. Arif, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Zeba Sattar. I think, uh, thanks for uh, giving this opportunity to the PRC, uh, FC College University. <clears throat> it's a really great honor for me to be here. Uh, Professor Gavin John is here, Dr. Zeba Star is here, Dr. Nasra Shah is also there, Professor Sikandar Hayat, Professor Vakas. <clears throat> and I remember during my PhD, I, I benefited from the book of Dr. Dilton. Uh, who wrote a very nice book uh, on uh, undermining the center in Pakistan. Uh, so I think it's a great opportunity for me to share with you on uh, internal migration. I think I congratulate uh, PRC for this choice of topics in this panel discussion uh, from demographic things, uh, fertility and mortality, we move to South Asia and East Asia migration, and now we are talking about the internal migration experience in Pakistan. Uh, <clears throat> next, please. Uh, my discussion uh, will be on uh, two or three things uh, concerning the internal migration. Uh, the first will be on the incidence of internal migration, then patterns of internal migration in Pakistan, and some of back police, uh, and some uh, on the implications of internal migration. Uh, the, the basic idea of picking uh, this internal migration topic for today's discussion is the availability of very recent data on internal migration, uh, which is uh, missing in uh, Pakistan. As you can say, we don't have a lot of information on internal migration, but in more recently, three data sets have given us this opportunity uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, the availability of data and some problems uh, in understanding uh, the issue of internal migration. <clears throat> Next, please. Uh, in terms of uh, importance of internal migration, uh, uh, we are talking a lot about uh, overseas migration. And uh, I was just reading one recent article which claims that the internal migration is uh, almost four times of the overseas migration in Pakistan. But you will see very little work, little data on internal migration because in overseas migration, everybody has interest. We are getting foreign exchange, but uh, from internal migration, it is a ignored and neglected things in, term, in, in the migration and development debate. Uh, in Pakistan, I think in other parts of the uh, region as well. Uh, but it is important issue and uh, we need to understand the dynamics of internal migration. It is very much related to the socioeconomic development as well as this uh, demographic issues and uh, economic and uh, social concerns and issues of Pakistan. <clears throat> Next, please. I'm just moving uh, uh, to the concept uh, which I will be talking uh, today. 
The first is that uh, it's very important, I think, uh, uh, for a regional comparison of internal migration, that in Pakistan, we talk about uh, inter-district migration and also lifetime migration. I think these two things, they underestimate, or you can say, uh, the incidence of migration is quite, uh, quite low in Pakistan when we compare with the uh, other countries, particularly uh, the Indian definition of internal migration. In this inter-district concept, we are ignoring within the district migration. And district is a quite large uh, uh, geographical entity in, 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 in Pakistan. And uh, a large of mobility, a, a lot of mobility is uh, within the district, but every survey and almost the census, we uh, don't include this uh, intra-district. But in Indian case, uh, India has a relatively long history of collecting data on internal migration, and they include intra-district as well. So I think it's a, it's a very big thing. Second is that we use the lifetime migration concept, uh, considering the current residence that is different from the uh, their district of birth. So it means the ignoring uh, this uh, <clears throat> migration between uh, birth and between the, the current place of residence. So with these two, I think, uh, two concepts, uh, we are lucky at least, I can say in terms of internal migration and development debate in Pakistan, the three different data sources, very recently they have collected information on internal migration. The first one is Pakistan Demographic and Health Survey, 2017 and 18. And we have also uh, a migration model from the PSLM, 2019 and 20. And Pakistan Labor Force Survey has also started uh, collecting information on internal migration uh, during uh, its uh, recent, uh, uh, <clears throat> recent rounds of the, of the census. But unfortunately, 2017 census does not provide the statistics on internal migration. And in earlier census, 1998 census, uh, the last uh, uh, previous residence urban classification was not available. So it was difficult to understand the uh, direction of mobility from rural to urban area. With these limitations, I will focus primarily on uh, the recent data sets and see uh, that the what pattern we can understand uh, from these data sets. Next, please. <clears throat> I think uh, uh, this, uh, this slide shows that the, at the national level, we, the incidence of internal migration according to the PDHS is about 11%, but PSLM gives quite half of, less than, uh, I think more than a little bit, half of this one incidence at 6%. And labor force survey, which, uh, which collects data on, uh, uh, on age 10 plus, this incidence is about 12 or 13 percent. So uh, it's very difficult based on uh, this uh, statistics to say what is the uh, uh, real incidence of internal migration in Pakistan, particularly uh, the PSLM data was quite a large data set, more than 200,000 households. And uh, same module was used uh, that was used in PDHS, also replicated in, in PSLM, but we have a different, uh, uh, you can say, migration rate or incidence of migration. Other thing is that Punjab has the, in all, I think, data sets, Punjab has the highest incidence of migration, internal migration, about 13%, and in PSLM, it is 7 or 8%. Send this at the, uh, the second one, 8% <clears throat> or 6%, then KP and uh, uh, obviously Balochistan. So I think uh, if we go back 20 or 30 years back, the situation was slightly different in, in terms of the provincial situation. But now it appears that the, the mobility 
uh, in, in, in Punjab is quite high uh, when we compare with, uh, with other uh, uh, provinces of the country. Next, please. <clears throat> Next, please. Uh, I think here there's a <clears throat> out migration. The uh, earlier, I think the the uh, slide was about in migration. We usually capture the phenomena of internal migration through the in migration statistics. Uh, out migration. The slide in front of you. Uh, uh, basically, it included in the in migration statistics we which we have discussed earlier. But the recent surveys, PDHS and PSLM, give us information on uh, out migration as well, uh, out migration within the country. Uh, I think from here you can see that uh, about 14% of uh, households uh, at the national level they reported that they have at least one member who is living in statistic country when the PDHS was carried out. And it is higher in rural areas than urban areas. Again, uh, Punjab is at the top in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, this out migration followed by KP. And, uh, but if you see at the bottom of this table, uh, then the highest out migration is reported from AJK and JB. Where in uh, GB is Gilgit Baltistan, it's about 20, 28%. In AJK, it is uh, 25%. It's a quite large proportion of households reported that they have at least one member primarily to, to work over there. We will see this from the reasons for migration. Next, please. <clears throat> Next, please. This next, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, <clears throat> in terms of patterns of uh, internal migration, uh, in many, uh, I think, studies recently, it has been reported that uh, within the province, province migration has increased over time uh, rather than the inter province migration. Situation in 70s and 60s used to be the different, but now I think the dynamics of internal migration are quite different. And uh, uh, a lot of migration is taking place within the province. Here you can see that the, from the PDHS, 90% uh, in uh, Punjab migration is within the province and 11% is uh, uh, between or across the province. Uh, same is the, uh, case uh, for PSLM in, in, in KP. But in Sindh and Balochistan, the situation is rather different, particularly. That if you see uh, that Sindh reported uh, more, uh, I think, uh, close to 40% uh, inter-province migration uh, than Punjab. But it suggests, it suggests that the, the in Sindh, uh, people are going from other provinces, but in other three provinces, uh, particularly uh, KP and Punjab, the mobility is mainly within the province. So that is, I think, a difference which we uh, keep in mind, uh, particularly in, in Sindh and Rajasthan, uh, some migrants are going from other provinces to uh, these areas, particularly in Karachi and Quetta. I will talk a little bit about this one in coming slides. Next, please. This is uh, reinforcing the things uh, which I am uh, I have said in the earlier, uh, earlier slide. If you see this first column, that in inter-province migration, migration between provinces, uh, the share of sin and KP uh, is quite substantial, but in inter-province, uh, almost three quarter of uh, migrants are from, uh, from Punjab. It tells us that the, the dynamics of uh, uh, internal migration, how the people are moving within Pakistan. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, 
interesting uh, district level uh, migration as well that in uh, punjab overall uh, the high migration districts are the rawalpindi lahore gujranwala shekhupura tobar tek singh and uh, uh, faisalabad but here you can see the from the second column uh, again very interesting phenomena that except rawalpindi in all other districts including uh, the uh, provincial capital lahore migrants is mainly migration is within the province people have moved from same province to lahore or gujranwala mainly the surrounding areas uh, but in rawalpindi almost uh, uh, half of the migrants they came from other provinces i think the mainly because of the proximity of rawalpindi with islamabad and also uh, the uh, armed services are here in rawalpindi so you can see the migrants are from other provinces who moved in in rawalpindi rest of the districts they are primarily from punjab uh, and in sind <clears throat> rachi east i think is mainly from within the pro province but in west and central karachi the mainly uh, migrants are from uh, uh, from other provinces birpur khas i think the next one and again it is uh, uh, the the from uh, from within the sind as well next please uh, tp i think we see here all high migration districts mainly from uh within the province mobility but in balochistan in quetta and loralai inter province migration uh, dominates than uh, the the other districts next please so i think they say these are the little bit dynamics of of uh, of uh, uh, internal migration that we can say in karachi and quetta you we are getting migrants from other provinces in these two cities but in karachi and in lahore and peshawar uh, the people are moving from within the provinces rawalpindi is getting migrants from uh, other provinces as well duration of residence uh, i think it's another very important uh, area here you can see that the uh, in last 5 years almost a quarter and little migration uh, between 2078 and 11 and 12 and uh, bulk has uh, moved more than 10 uh, years same is the situation almost in uh, in in all provinces many studies they have linked this uh, uh, year wise data with the economic growth you can see the the uh, next slide that although in pakistan it is very difficult to say uh, next please that the how this mobility is linked with the economic growth that whether high gdp growth creates more opportunities for employment but it to some extent is true that the the period where economic growth was high the uh, it looks that the incidence of in, uh, internal migration was high as well but this is the area which needs some more uh, serious research as well next please uh i think uh, more going very quickly what literature has suggest that the weather migration or the migrants are selective yes in case of pakistan it looks that the migrants are selective or selectivity is there female first selection is a female quite a lot of uh, discussion on female migration primarily for marriage purpose next please uh age selectivity is there you can see that the, it is between the age 21 and uh, primarily between 50 uh but uh, age selectivity is there as well although the people from all ages are moving uh, uh, in, 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 in within the pakistan next please education selectivity is there higher the education the higher the probability of people uh, moving to to other place of the country next please and quantile i think uh, this is interesting as well this quantile is at the destination 
One reason could be that the migrants have improved their economic status after reaching to their uh, uh, place of uh, destination, but it looks that the selectivity has it holds as well in terms of the of the wealth status. So migrants uh, in Pakistan are selective. This is a little bit different from the Indian case, where recently I think uh, I was reading a couple of studies which shows that the poorest people they have been moving a lot, poorest and unskilled workers in in in, in the case of India. Uh, but I think we need some more comparative studies to see that the how selectivity works in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh particularly. Next, please. Socioeconomic implication, uh, let me go quickly. Dr. Zeba Star has mentioned this one, and also Dr. Sikandar Hayat, uh, that internal migration, uh, one implication is uh, uh, about the urbanization. By a recent work at the Population Council uh, with Dr. Zeba Star, uh, that if you see the age of classification, then urbanization level in Pakistan is close to 50%. Uh, and uh, in density, it is 42%, but what data has shown us is 36%. In my own work based on the 1998 census, I estimated in 2003, almost 16, 17 years back, uh, that 39% of people were living in urban areas. So the one implication of internal migration is uh, this urbanization and uh, about 20% uh, of uh, contribution to urban growth is uh, from this one. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, I think it has effect on, uh, on uh, this whole urban system and uh, uh, what my argument here is that uh, the urbanization in Pakistan or urban system is maturing. Maturing is a, a way that it is not only large cities, they are growing, rather whole city network, about five or 600 cities are getting very dynamic and they are connected well with each other and it uh, are also transforming the rural areas of the country. I think uh, this, uh, you, you can see that because of this internal mobility, uh, we can see a lot of changes. Uh, there's a need to work uh, to see more that the, how this urban system and city network is uh, working in Pakistan and particularly connecting the rural areas with the urban center as well. I remember, Professor Nizamuddin one mentioned that the how this triangular, Sialkot, Gudramwala, and Gujarat, this is hub of the small industries, uh, that the how rural and urban areas, they, they, they are linked with each other. And uh, uh, Raza Ali has also mentioned in his very good work on uh, this urban system. So this is the new thing Arif Hassan has uh, uh, based on some work in South Asia. Uh, in uh, South Punjab and also in Sindh has come up with the uh, similar findings that this uh, transformation is uh, taking place in the case of Pakistan. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> next, please. I think reason, I think uh, reason I would like, one thing is very puzzling here in, uh, in reasons for uh, uh, reasons for migration. Uh, never, previous slide, please. That according to the uh, labor force survey, uh, uh, according to the labor force survey, 22% of migrants reported that they have returned to their home. That and majority of this is uh, from the KP. Uh, and KP disproportion is almost 35%. It means that the recently, a lot of people, they have returned to home. These people may be uh, that they return from uh, overseas and maybe from the uh, other, other areas of Pakistan. Uh, I think uh, that is the area which we need to see some more work. Other terms of implications, uh, I think very quickly that, uh, relatively a greater proportion of migrants 
are reported their uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, their uh, as imply. It means that the as uh, Dr. Sikandar mentioned in his uh, opening remarks that the people are uh, uh, putting pressure on the urban labor market particularly. Next, please. Next, please. Poverty, I think, uh, 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 let me just uh, conclude what I can say here, uh, that this uh, pattern of migration in Pakistan, uh, it has uh, three or four particular implications. Uh, then the first implication is for the urban system. And second implication is on uh, the labor market and third implication it has on the, on the poverty. It has a positive impact on, on, on poverty reduction. But uh, uh, what I can say is that you would need to continue this uh, migration modules in three data sources, uh, labor force, PSML, PSLM, and also the PHS, and uh, to make them consistent with each other so we can uh, uh, compare the results over the time and to see the trends in, uh, in internal migration as well. But just as a final word, uh, I have been engaged in migration phenomena for many, many years. I think the future of the country is in, in urban, not in rural areas. We need to see this uh, population mobility very positively and to make cities friendly to the migrants rather than uh, thinking other way around. I think it is, the, it is the future of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Arif. Uh, you said the future of Pakistan. I think the present of Pakistan is also overwhelmingly urban. Um, and uh, already we can see those effects in the cities that, where we live. Thank you so much. That was such a, uh, again, another very rich uh, presentation. And I just wish we had longer to discuss each of these. But as I keep pointing out, we will take questions uh, right after the next presentation. Last but not least for this segment is Dr. Minhaj Khidwai. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of UNIT Consultants Center for Healthcare Innovation and Transformation and Synth and also the, the founder of the Sindh Healthcare Commission. Dr. Minhaj um, has had an extended uh, career in health. He has also been at the Department of Community Health Sciences at Aar Khan University uh, and a faculty member of the American Institute of Healthcare Quality since 2015. Um, he has uh, extended three decades of international experience in healthcare management, research, human capacity building and academics. Um, and uh, as I already said, he is uh, founder of the major healthcare regulatory body in, uh, in Sindh, which is the Healthcare Commission, um, worked for UNSF, WHO, USA, JAPAIGO, OPM, amongst others. Most recently, Dr. Minhaj has authored a book called A to Z of Healthcare Quality um, and is working on another book called Forest Therapy for Public Health and Social Sciences a very um, active academic and well-known personality. Over to you, uh, Dr. Minhaj Kudwai. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm thankful to the FC College for providing this uh, opportunity to me. And uh, it so uh, feels pleasure to be a part of such a robust academic group. Uh, um, and I would like to focus my presentation mostly on the uh, policy aspect and the holistic aspect of public health policy and disease control. It will not be as much data as uh, Dr. GMRF just uh, presented because I'm not a data person, I'm a health management person. So next slide, please. Go ahead, please. So public health uh, is basically defined as the art and science of preventing the disease, prolonging life and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. And the state developed policies for welfare of people, I put it as self, next. Next please.
And the systems uh, provide security from the spread of diseases, access to affordable and quality care to people, and the resources for the systems and institutions to play their role. Next. <clears throat> So the core activities of public health are it prevents the epidemics and spread of disease, protects against environmental hazards, responds to disasters, prevents injuries, promotes healthy behavior, assures the quality and accessibility of services, monitors the health status of population, mobilizes community action, reach out to the high risk of and hard to reach people, uh, researching to develop insights and innovative solutions, and lead to the development of a sound health policy and planning. Next. So the 10 essential public health services uh, that are a part of this whole process are, we start with the assessment, which includes the monitoring of health, diagnosing, investigating, and inform education, empower the community, uh, lead, led by the policy development with the mobilization of the community, engaging partnerships, developing policies, and leading to the assurance to the general community about the uh, law enforcement regulations linked to the services, assuring competent workforce availability and monitoring and evaluation. So, and focusing mostly on the systems management and research, that's critical because if we do not have the data through research, we will not be able to manage anything. So systems management is important. Uh, while we are dealing with the public uh, health policy aspect. Next slide. So, uh, as I said earlier, that uh, we have us to deal with the systems and develop the systems. Uh, systems uh, have institutions, resources, and the people that has to be developed uh, in terms of the system development process. Next slide. Next, please. So health system is the totality of social culture beliefs and practices, policies, programs, structural arrangements, and institutions involved in production and distribution of goods and services meant to promote health, prevent healthiness, and prolong life. Next. And health systems should deal in the context of complete well-being of the individual and the community. Next. And the uh, public policy basically deals with ensuring that system is in place in order to deal with the community and ensure that the community is taken care of. Next. So uh, from the epidemiological perspectives, uh, the determinants of health uh, are the social environment. Next, the physical environment and the biological environment. And social environment includes income and social status, social support, health practices, coping skills, and culture, while the physical environment deals with the education, literacy, employment, working conditions, housing, health services, while the biological environment deals with the healthy child development, biology, and generative endowment, gender. While these are the basically the uh, determines of health from the epidemiological perspective, but when we talk about the uh, health policy perspective, the determinants of health that we have to focus on. Next slide. These uh, include the self or the individuals of the people, the state, the society, and the systems. And the individuals of the self are factors include the income and social status, education, employment status, housing, basic amenities, health practice, coping skills, healthy child development, biology and genetics. Next. And the state has to deal with the leadership that it has shown or develop the policies focused on the requirements of the country, uh, food provision, education, economy, uh, safety, and security. While the society has to deal with the social inclusion, environment, and culture, and the systems have to develop the institutions for quality service and research. Resources mobilization has to be there and effective utilization and efficient utilization of the resources. And the people have to be provided an affordable, accessible, available and uh, security protection, information, human resources, products and technology management. 
So we need to differentiate between the determinants of health from the epidemiological perspective and the determinants of health that we have to consider while we are developing policy, which includes the self, state, society, and systems. Next slide. So uh, the public health policy is defined as the laws, regulations, actions, and decisions implemented by the state within a society in order to establish systems to ensure wellness and meet specific health goals. Next slide. And the objective is to create the conditions for good and equitable health among the entire population and to end avoidable health inequalities. Next. And the strategies have to build accordingly. Next. So who are the stakeholders in public health policy? These are the institutions, organizations, development partners, regulatory bodies, media, academia, judiciary, the opinion leaders, and the government, and also the patients and clients who are being served are the end users, the healthcare providers, and the healthcare establishments or the hospitals or the healthcare providers at the same time, and all dealing with ensuring the quality of care for all. Next. So basically, the health policy deals with the access and update of health interventions, quality of del care delivery to all health institutions and interventions to reduce uh, the physiological risk factors to improve the health outcomes, and ultimately leading to providing a financial protection from the health costs with the collaboration from the intersectoral policies to reduce the behavioral and environmental risk factors ultimately focusing on reducing the physiological risk factors to improve health outcomes and all leading towards the financial protection from health costs. Next. So the aims are to provide a system which can provide the security protection from health hazards, identifying preparing for public health challenges, preparing for responding to public health emergencies and improving health by managing sharing information and expertise. Systems engage institutions and provide resources for health needs. And the systems contract out and provide quality care through accessible and affordable health care for the benefit of people. So the focus is to develop a system. And when we talk of uh, systems and public health policies, we, the systems uh, can be developed when we have a structured stewardship or the leadership and which is focused on the goals. And these structure that is followed is that we have inputs, we have the process, we have the outputs, the outcomes, and ultimately leading to the impact. So I'll give an example, next slide. Um, when we're dealing with the security and protection from public health hazard and challenges, we have the focus on the impact, which is the uh, security and protection from public health hazard and challenges. Go on, please. And the inputs which are required are planning for the assessment, and then the process is the research and the data development, the collection through the surveillance epidemiology, and leading towards the policy development and the committee mobilization, which leads to the outcome of assurance, regulation. I would request everyone to mute, please, so Dr. Kadwai can continue. Please go ahead. Dr. Kadwai? Jeep. So this is uh, one of the examples uh, that has been uh, given to see how the uh, policies are developed from the health management perspective uh, with the inputs of the planning assessment, processing with the research, uh, developing data for the policy development, community mobilization, and the outcome which is uh, available for the assurance and regulation of, of providing of the workforce and linkage to the services leading to the impact of uh, people feeling sec feel secured and protected from public health hazards and challenges. Next slide. Uh, 
Next slide, please. And focus that again comes to the development of the systems where we have the people, institutions, and the resources that needs to be developed for developing the system. Next slide. Next slide, please. So public health policy is focused on the population and the state developing the policies and the society providing the resources for the development of the uh, systems. Next slide. So now moving on to the disease uh, uh, control aspect, uh, the principles for disease control are the principle strategies to reduce the disease incidence and prevalence, morbidity and mortality. And the strategies uh, are to uh, undertake the assessment with the surveillance and epidemiology application to the public health research and the actions for programs and policies development. Next slide. So the levels of prevention are basically the primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Next slide. Primordial deals with the actions to minimize the future health hazards, inhibits the establishment of factors which are known to increase the risk of disease, addresses broad health terms rather than preventing personal exposure to risk factors, and policy development focus on the determinants of health. Next slide. While the primary level basically yeah. deals with the prevention that and the onset of system. diseases, risk reduction that by that altering behaviors, and enhancing that resistance to the effects of exposure. While the community is somehow submerged within the part of the primary, and I would like to focus to the policy. Maybe taken as a they all play a major role. So unfortunately, uh, the problem over here that we see that primary health, uh, uh, primary care of level prevention basically uh, does not include much from the community participation and community engagement uh, and the role of family doctors, I think community doctors also needs to be stressed. So public health a policy uh, that needs to be developed maybe uh, need more focusing on the community aspect, developing more community health workers, focusing on community midwives and the community nurses uh, can play a major role. Next slide. So secondary level of prevention is deals with detection, treatment and control disease progression, uh, screening procedures, uh, the tertiary deals with the softening the impact of disease on patients' functions, longevity and quality of life, reduce prevalence and rehabilitation. Next slide. Next slide. While another level of which uh, I want to introduce and could be a subject of topic for discussion were quaternary, where uh, First, do no harm should be the main principle of uh, the prevention and the actions taken to identify patient at risk of over medicalization and to suggest interventions ethically acceptably. Uh, while we are dealing with the patients, uh, there's disease mongering and commercialization of disease also takes place. So the institution's uh, involvement for protection and prevention is important. Self willingness for restraint being critical of our own work judicious use of limited public sources. We need to see exactly that uh, what amount of resources available, how judiciously this could be utilized, what are the priorities that needs to be handled first, and self-relation for the social costs resulting from the medical decisions. So this is important that we focus more on the conceptualization of the first do no harm to the patient, to the society, to the and the resources available are utilized with effectively and efficiently. Next slide. 
So again, summarizing the uh, levels of prevention, we have the primordial where the policies are developed, then the primary prevention for the risk of the onset of diseases, secondary is detection and treatment and control disease progression, tertiary softening the impact of disease, improve quality of life, rehabilitation, and quaternary first do no harm, which has deal with the collective role of self, society, state, and systems. It cannot be done alone, and we have to raise the noise level in terms of the policymakers for ensuring there's a collective involvement of the individual, society, state, and systems to ensure that patient is uh, not uh, the focus of uh, harming. Patient should be provided the quality of care. Next slide. So uh, just to give you an example of about the disease control, we have seen uh, COVID-19, which has been a paradigm shift. Next. So there are many problems. We can deal with a fixed mindset. We can deal with a growth mindset, or we can deal with an innovation uh, mindset. Next slide. So we have to deal with the disease control in terms of COVID with the self, society, state, and systems uh, application. Next slide. So when we're dealing with the COVID, we have the self issues. Uh, we have the state issues to be handled. Next slide. We have the systems issues to be handled and then the society issues to be handled. So disease, Next slide. So we uh, have the primordial state level policies to be developed. We have developed the disease control and isolation centers, primary prevention uh, for the COVID and the society level application also has to be uh, ensured that social distancing usage of PPEs uh, were there, the secondary prevention where the systems uh, are ensured. And at the self level, we make sure that the protection takes place. Next slide. So are we really, uh, so tertiary care, uh, physical therapy, mental health and management, and the quaternary care, the first do no harm. Vaccination uh, definitely has been a challenge to all of us, uh, and uh, there was no choice for us to get the vaccination. The uh, commercialization of disease was there, and we need to sh make sure that people are not subjected to harm. Next slide. Dr. Kudwai, I'd really request if you could wind up, but yeah. we'll have next no time Okay, for okay. okay. next slide. So we are not in a post-COVID era, and uh, I would like to conclude the uh, next slide. So public health essential elements, assessment, policy development, assurance system in development, research, implementation policy, and disease control uh, need combined effort of self, system, society, and state, and with an innovative mindset. Next slide. Please. Uh, so I would like to conclude on this. The health system lack focus on public health. It's built around hospitals as doctors are trained and focused on treating sick people. We smoke knowingly that it's an honorable form of suicide. Public health policies need to focus on all the five levels of prevention, which is better than treating a disease. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tai, and I apologize that I had to because I cut you short a little bit, but not too much. Uh, we have barely like about 25 minutes now. Uh, in fact, even less, I would say, but 20 minutes for discussion. Um, and I'd like to give a chance for the silent listeners. Um, thank you, first of all, to all the speakers, but um, I also thank you to the people, 70 people have uh, joined this uh, conversation. And, and uh, though we don't have much time, but it would be very nice to hear from some of them. There is a question in the chat box. And so just to, um, if, if you could put your questions in the chat box or raise your hands um, you know, virtually, then we'll try and squeeze in at least five or six questions and responses. And please say to whom they are addressed. Uh, Dr. Nastra, would you like to ask the first question? If you could unmute yourself. 
Um, uh, otherwise, I could. Uh, yeah. Okay, please okay. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thanks Zeba, and thank thanks to all the organizers for this for this wonderful wonderful opportunity to see so many friends again. Uh, basically, I mean, it's more a comment than a question, uh, but a general question to uh, whoever wants to address it, and maybe it's too uh, broad. But I mean, I see the need in Pakistan and elsewhere for not just modules within surveys, which then we deal with in very piecemeal fashions, but a comprehensive migration survey, both including both internal and international migration. I would like to see that happen in Pakistan uh, before too long. Basically, that, that's a common. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think everyone would really support in that. We've been trying for four or five years uh, to get a migration survey, but uh, what we got was the migration module in the DHS. But then we also fought to have a maternal mortality survey, and we did, we've did. we had two. So I think um, voices like yours and Dr. Arif and I would totally uh, support that because migration is so central to urbanization, international migration to remittances, the economy. I mean, what's underlying the demographic shifts in Pakistan and uh, not to have a survey that where we can connect the dots, uh, I think is very important. Dr. Arif, would you like to respond to that also? Uh, I think I, yeah. I also fully agree uh, with Dr. Nasser Shah, USL. Uh, I had a chance to attend the Asian conference about, I think, one month back. There is a consideration internationally to start a migration survey uh, like we have PDHS. I think maybe in coming years, uh, some good thing can come uh, globally as well. But I think she is right that we need a special migration survey. I fully agree. Thank you. Um, any other questions, uh, please do uh, raise your hand. Um, There's a virtual hand feature under reactions. Um, Yes, there is a question from uh, PRC from uh, no other than Muhammad Waqasabi. Please go ahead. Uh, my question is to Dr. Eric Fong. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, migration within South Asia and Southeast Asia, I just wanted to get his comments on whether uh, we can uh, look towards regulating this migration following something like the EU model or not. Uh, thank um, you, Vakas. Yes, over to you, Eric. Yes. Um, do you mind to repeat the second half of your um of your question? I can't hear too well. Uh, yes. Uh, I I want to know if we could, uh, as a region, regulate this migration better for the betterment of the migration, uh, like following something like the EU model. Oh, okay. Um, I uh, as I mentioned in my um, discussion, I guess, um, the study of migration in East and Southeast Asia, mainly a lot of the study are based on the, um, the government statistics. So therefore, details information about like why people move and the, the socioeconomic background of individuals, we don't have those information. So we have some general aggregate data. So um, some of the model that um, you, we want to explore because of the limitation of data, I don't think we can do it. I would like to echo the previous um, uh, comment that I think no matter in, in South Asia or even East and Southeast Asia, I think we need more um, survey data looking at individual level to collect information about the socioeconomic and demographic background of individuals so that we can do more um, comprehensive uh, multivariate modeling so that we can you know, to see how the, the patterns of migration um, in these two regions, at least, uh, um, how they, you know, what, what factors contribute to, to their migration pattern. I mean, at this point, we just have a very um, general aggregated data. I also wanted to ask you, Dr. Fong, that uh, whether there were any panel surveys that uh, would really record all the phenomenon that you mentioned, right from moving out the reasons and then the impact on the family extended uh, friends. I mean, whether we don't actually just even need survey data, but we also really should be looking forward towards panel data 
to really study the long-term effects uh, of remittances and in countries like Pakistan, of course, East Asia also. So just to comment. Um, thank you very much. I think we have uh, one more question from Jamal Nasir, Dr. Jamal Nasir. Please ask your question. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, um, my question, specific question, is relevant to your great talk that uh, uh, you worked excellent for the uh, population and growth development in Pakistan. And 2007 to 10, that you have uh, come up with the idea that the fertility stall is coming in Pakistan. I want to comment on by that time, really, the fertility stall was coming. Now it is visible. Um, whether there could be any issues affecting on the fertility estimates with reference to Pakistan and how you can see uh, Pakistan has an old family planning program, but it's quite unsuccessful story. If you demarcate on two factors on the program side, definitely raised by the government and the non program side, that is about adoptability of the uh, nation, how we can motivate the nation that, that this program is going to be successful in the future or not. Thank you very much for giving the time. Um, thank you. Um, this, it's, a, it's a difficult question, but I'm going to try and take just 10 seconds to answer it. I, I think that, uh, yes, the program um, improvement to me is uh, more, uh, it's easier, it's visible what we are not doing. Uh, we are not putting in enough finances. Um, the health sector is not, uh, has not really fully taken its responsibility because of uh, you know, they, they rely on the population, uh, population which is very small, and the private sector has not been incentivized. And we're working on all these three areas through the CCI uh, recommendations that Dr. Gavin Jones mentioned. I hope we will see some improvement, but I think the other factors may be even more important, but more difficult to change. And I did emphasize that I think unless we change uh, actively opportunities when we talk about a youth Kamyam youth program, we almost envisage a whole lot of young men. I know that young women are being included, but it has to be, I think in ways we have to go more further with young women and opportunities. And when we do special education accelerated programs, they should really be, and you will see that the change will follow because you know these, uh, I think that Dr. Gavin emphasized uh, that you know it's all the social change that changes, dem drives demand. And then women and couples find their own way to reduce fertility. Whether the program, I hope it improves, but even regardless. So I hope I've answered some of your questions. We could have a long chat later, but I'd like to give others a chance. Um, can I see other hands um, up? Um, any questions from the panelists to other panelists? That would be also very interesting. Zeba, you have something in the chat box. Okay, so, uh, okay, so can, can Mr. Ms. Memuna Kazi ask that question? It'll be nice. So rather than us reading it. Yes, sure. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Thank you for a great discussion today. And my question is directed for Dr. Gavin Jones. Uh, you mentioned the challenges for the right-based approach to family planning in terms of a desired family size of either three or four children. Now, if we consider the motivations behind large family size, most of the times Pakistani couples have some preferring attitudes driving this large family size. Uh, so how can we help devise a family planning program which addresses the issue of son preference? Gavin? Yes, uh, thank you for that uh, question. Um, I think the issue of some preference, if we're wanting to deal with that, we have to go beyond a, a family planning program approach. Um, I mean, some preference is uh, linked to the whole situation, you know, the gender situation in, uh, in, in, in Pakistan. And um, if the situation of women is improved in all sorts of ways, which have been discussed as, as we addressed earlier, uh, that's going to be linked to the, you know, diminution of some preference. So the, the, these two things are sort of linked to each other. So it seems to me it's not exactly within the family planning program as such that we uh, deal with this issue, but, you know, much more broadly within the society. But, you know, not wanting to cop out on that question, of course, um, uh, family planning workers in various ways, I suppose, can uh, 
uh, in, in encourage attitudes, uh, you know, all, all of the attitudes which um, work against sun preference in the society. But, uh, you know, as I say, I think it's a much broader thing than just the, um, the family planning program. Thank you, uh, Gavin. And a related question uh, from Zagra Muniz. Uh, Zahra Muniz, sorry. Oh, uh, the question is- Oh, Zahra Muniz. Um, can, you, can you ask your question? Actually, it's for all of us, but she asked whether the issue is cultural, a primary reason for failure of planning programs. Um, I, I would like to start that discussion, but I'd like to hear from others. I don't think so. I, 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 of course, it's cultural. But structural solutions solve a lot of the culturally <clears throat> long lasting. I mean, after all, all countries have cultures uh, that originate and you know prevail, but changes do happen. And I think structural changes do happen. And if they're offered, uh, our surveys and our research shows that particularly women and girls are very receptive, young people very receptive to change employment opportunities, working outside the home, um, aspects like that. But would somebody else like to respond to that as well? Gavin? Uh... <laughs> I, I agree with what you said. <laughs> so I don't think I have any more to say. Okay. Um, so let's see if we have uh, any more, otherwise we could start winding up. Um, any other brave souls want to ask questions? Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so Dr. Minhaj Khidwa is asking, we need innovative approaches in dealing with population issues. And I think everyone would agree. There's a hand up, Dr. Fozia Baloch, please do ask your question. Uh, yeah, it's not a question, but it's uh, uh, more related to the question asked about the sun preference uh, in the society. I think there are so many underlying reasons why sons are preferred uh, on daughters. So if we are able to tackle the issues related to gender, like uh, why parents want son, because in the society, uh, as it has been already mentioned in all the talks, that uh, uplifting the status of women in the society, educating them and providing them employability opportunities, because the son has to be the breadwinner of the family and has to take care of the parents as, as a responsibility when they grow old. So that's the reason they prefer uh, to have son, uh, sons rather than daughters. So again, the opportunity that to educate the girls and to uh, enable them to earn and take care, changing the role of women in the society, that matters. If we are able to change the role that no, it's the child who takes care of the uh, parents. And uh, in our society, as we know that uh, religion religious interpretations play a very huge role. So again, bringing out the positive side of religion that any child can take care of the parents as a responsibility, I think that will minimize the son preference issue that has been discussed here. So we more need to uh, tackle the issues of gender, especially the status of one human being uh, being superior than the other, like women in our society is usually uh, not considered to be a human being as well. So when we talk about humans, we say that the men and uh, all the blessings that God has given to the men, including women. So the woman doesn't stand as a single entity herself as an individual. She has to be a property. So when we, uh, we are able to change that mindset through awareness, and other activities that we carry on. I think this issue has to, can be minimized with the passage of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Fozia. I think you've given concrete this, I mean, suggestions. And I, I think uh, it really uh, roots our entire conversation that uh, the position of women has to improve in Pakistan. It really stands out jarringly. Uh, it has influenced everything. And there are solutions. I, I think that there are very good uh, interventions underway that do show uh, that very quickly you can change the position of women in places like Tharparkar, Sindh, and Baluchistan, etc. So, um, and then the preference of sons will change as women do, uh, you know, work outside the home and are seen as contributing members. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I did see a hand, a Dr. Simon's hand, go up. Um, 
Would he like to ask his question? Uh, maybe he has decided Here not is to... a question by Mr. Asad Javed. Oh. Mr. Asad Javed, if you could go yes. ahead and ask your question, please. Yeah, please. I can read his question. His question is, is there data being recorded on interprovincial economic flow of each city in Pakistan? This question is for Dr. Arif. Mm. Uh, no, I don't think so. That we, as, uh, we don't have any information uh, for this uh, intercity flows, except if we can estimate uh, internal remittances by district, uh, that is the indirect way, uh, but I don't think that there are some estimates that the how much is uh, going back from <clears throat> urban to rural areas, but I think this inter-district mobility, I don't think that we have uh, information on this, uh, this type of things what he is asking. Yeah. But I think interesting thing, uh, maybe difficult to capture through surveys, uh, but interesting uh, to, to do some research. I think your center can take lead on this one. Dr. Bakas, I think that uh, maybe we are approaching the break. Uh, I think everyone does need a break before yes, another red session. Uh, so if you permit me, I'll just uh, underscore that I think there are areas of research, as Dr. Arif said, uh, you know, the questions that were raised uh, about data availability, about research on migration. I think is really, really uh, something that we hope very much that the three new centers will take up as issues of urbanization as well. And the continuing issues of why fertility has not stalled, but uh, really moving very, very slowly in the Pakistani context. I think you have some good base to move on, but maybe we need more in-depth studies, particularly about Punjab and um, coming out of, well, not necessarily Punjab for the whole country, but different parts looking at more in-depth reasons uh, across the country. Um, and uh, lastly, I would say that, uh, you know, the, the study on health systems points out it's a complicated matter and COVID-19 is probably uh, influencing uh, everything in terms of how health systems will evolve and they do need to be evolved differently, um, possibly, but because they haven't really worked for uh, many years. So um, I won't really try to summarize the rich discussion except to say, there's a huge agenda for research, Dr. Vakas. You have, uh, you know, you have to bear it on your shoulders. But you are so uh, fortunate as to have colleagues across FCCU, and I see large attendance, which I recognize from Lahore School of Economics. And uh, so I think a lot of collaborative research would be really um, maybe from other places. I saw somebody from Bhutan's as well. So um, collaborative research across Pakistan's universities is really going to really lead us forward in finding these solutions. We can't always look externally because I think Dr. Fong's talk uh, really led us into thinking about how different, I mean, his um, you know, migration patterns are, uh, international migration is in Far East compared to uh, South Asia and particularly Pakistan. So we have to look more inwards for our research, though while drawing on the rich research that is happening, but generate new research. And that is the basis of why um, the center was formed and great confidence that this university will go ahead and produce this research. Hopefully next year, there'll be more presentations from FCCU as well. So thank you very much from my side. We're taking a 15 minute break. Uh, Dr. Vakas, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Seba. I would like to personally thank each and every panelist. Uh, and I think my takeaway from this session was that uh, uh, regional or region-based research needs to be done for which institutes like ours uh, and that exist in other universities should collaborate more. Uh, with these words, we're gonna take a 15 minute break and we will recommence at 12.05, uh, 12 minutes and five minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Zeva Sitar for chairing this panel. Uh, we are most grateful, thank you. See you all in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to start the second session of the panel discussion uh, that we have organized today. Uh, our channel, our, uh, our esteemed uh, chair of, for this session uh, would be Dr. Ali Mir. Uh, Dr. Ali Mir is an accomplished researcher. <laughs> Please mute yourself, Mr. B. <laughs> My apologies. Dr. Ali Mir uh, will be chairing the second session of our uh, panel discussion. Dr. Ali Mir is an accomplished researcher and senior program director with over 20 years professional experience and expertise in family planning. He is responsible for teaching technical leadership of population council projects in Pakistan related to family planning, reproductive health, including sexually transmitted infections, capacity building and leadership development in population and RH. Dr. Mir made significant strategic, technical and management contributions to USAID's flagship $48 million family advancement for life and health, also called FALA, Behavioral Change Communication BCC project in Pakistan. Dr. Mir recently implemented a technique developed by the University of Aberdeen, referred to as Made in, Made for, for estimating maternal mortality and identifying its causes and circumstances using community information networks at the district level to measure provincial maternal mortality ratio for KP province. Previously, Dr. Mir led one of the major studies on reproductive tract and sexually transmitted infections in Pakistan. He spearheaded the development and implementation of an initiative to expand contraceptive choices where 3,055 participants were trained in emergency contraception and contributed to the development of the training module on client-centered family planning delivery. Dr. Mir holds a master's in public health from Leeds University, UK, and a degree in medicine from Rawalpindi Medical College. It is with a great pleasure that I invite uh, Dr. Mir to come in and uh, chair the proceedings. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vakas. And thank you for that generous introduction. It's a very great honor for me and a privilege to be uh, present today at this uh, uh, panel discussion that we will be having today. We have a very uh, distinguished group of panelists, uh, luminaries in the field. And um, so without any further ado, now I'd like to uh, begin. And uh, our first panelist is uh, uh, Dr. Fareed Mindit. Before I invite Dr. Farid, uh, I'd like to briefly introduce him to you or to all of the uh, participants. Uh, Dr. Farid is uh, currently working as professor and chair of uh, public health department at the Ikra University in Karachi. Uh, Dr. Farid is a medical doctor having advanced training in public health and demography uh, from the John Hopkins University. Uh, he has worked uh, as a population and health expert at the Aga Khan University Karachi, the Asia Foundation, uh, Population Council in Japaigo, as well as at Qasim University, Saudi Arabia. In uh, 2000, he founded the Safe Motherhood Alliance, which helped in developing the national strategy of maternal, neonatal, and child health, and the country's first national MNCH program. Uh, so Dr. Farid will be uh, talking today about Pakistan's population explosion, uh, its causes and uh, consequences. So over to Dr. Farid. Thank you very much, Dr. Alimir. Uh, my slideshow on. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. So hopefully I think I will not repeat most of the things which were uh, said this morning. It was a very you know, rich session and a lot of like uh, uh, new information was also there and the, you know, the different aspects of the population growth. Uh, I would rather call population overgrowth in Pakistan. 
what I would like to do is to maybe focus mostly on the very, you know, uh, things which are on the surface, which are the major issues with population program and population uh, control in Pakistan, the family planning program in Pakistan. And uh, I would also like to maybe, you know, highlight some of the uh, reasons and uh, what is happening right now and what can we expect in the future. So can we go to the next slide, please? So just uh, uh, starting, actually, I think everybody has been talking about population explosion since morning, and uh, it's not really, you know, uh, such a new word, uh, at least in this group, hopefully. Uh, but has it occurred in Pakistan? I think it has, and I'll try to show you and uh, convince you that it has. And why has this happened? I think we have talked about this morning also, but we will I would like to try and you know highlight some of the you know less discussed issues, and finally you know basically uh, what is next for Pakistan, and this is basically not uh, not not assuming that uh, uh, this this particular uh, phase which we have is going to go away because it's not going away. So next slide, please. In terms of population explosion, so I think when many of you probably have read Paul Ehrlich. Uh, a population bomb uh, it's in sort of a old kind of like school thing and uh, it was uh, criticized uh, maybe rightly so but remember that uh, two things one is that uh, population explosion is generally not catastrophic and dramatic as as uh, it, it is shown in in movies like inferno or you know it basically you know is very subtle but it destroys uh, the, the, the society in many, many ways. You know, there are wars, there are like famines and there are, you know, poverty, there's increasing unemployment, uh, increasing suicidal rates. Everything can be related to, you know, a disbalance in population. Unfortunately, in our society, we have the haves and the have nots. And, uh, Population uh, explosion, if you will, it actually affects have-nots more and far less the has uh, to which we all belong, uh, fortunately, and alhamdulillah. So we, we probably don't like feel that, uh, that blow of the explosion. That's, that's what I would like you to remember. Next slide, please. This is uh, the story, and uh, I think uh, maybe somebody has shown it before also. 1951 to 19, sorry, 2017, you know, uh, the population has been increasing very, very steadily and very rapidly, unlike uh, most of the rest of the countries of the region and the world. Next slide. And I can show you that uh, population has doubled twice. So in less than 50 years after independence, actually our population crossed uh, uh, four times. It's, uh, uh, what it was at the time of independence in 1947. So right now it's, uh, you know, the last census told us it's 208 almost, although our estimates and most of the demographers, uh, experts had estimated that it will be probably around 200 million, but it actually was more than that. Next slide. And this is the story also, the part which uh, government has been hiding i mean different governments have been hiding Cons uh, consistently we have been told that population growth rate in pakistan is around 2 uh, 1.5 at one time i remember you know the government was officially saying it was 1.3 percent never in the six censuses the intercensor annual population growth rate has gone down below 2.3 percent 2.3 percent is a very very large kind of you know rate of population growth so that is uh, not going to change. I mean, I don't have any reason to, to see whether it's going to change in the future. So next slide, please. Uh, so what will happen in the future? 100 years after uh, Pakistan's independence or partition, uh, what will be, you know, if we, uh, if we don't change our ways, uh, the population will cross, uh, certainly cross 400 million. And if we try very, very hard and something extraordinary happen in the next uh, in the remaining 28 or so years, I think uh, maybe we will settle at about 325. 
million. I don't think any any reason to believe that uh, we can do better than that. I'm basically most of the experts who have been like working on different kind of regression models. I saw one, I think, uh, last week, and 350 is probably 350 million is probably something which we can say. And remember that you know the younger people in this group will be around. Uh, we will not be around some of us, but uh, uh, our children will be, and this will be a very difficult uh, stage, the very difficult phase. Next. Uh, this is a comparison of the total fertility rate, uh, and uh, just to you know, so that we don't look very bad, I have included Afghanistan here. So you see that uh, all the other countries of the region are uh, like at the fertility, uh, sorry, replacement level fertility level or below. Actually, Sri Lanka is uh, probably 1.8, uh, but uh, according to the latest uh, World Bank report, it was 2.2. It really doesn't matter. Sri Lanka is certainly at or below replacement level fertility, which is 2.1, you know, so. India has announced, as you all know, recently, their fifth national family health survey has uh, confirmed that their uh, total fertility rate overall in the nation is 2.0. This comparison with female literacy rate is actually makes sense, and it has worked also with other uh, indicators of education, as some of the speakers have told us this morning, like secondary school education, uh, enrollment ratio and secondary school completion rate, you know. I have tried, uh, not in this slideshow, but I have tried to, you know, uh, compare countries across uh, the different, like, you know, uh, the same same and different uh, income groups. Uh, with regard... Sorry, with regard to basically uh, secondary school enrollment ratio between male and female and uh, that's a very powerful indicator if, uh, you know, and if we have uh, any hopes, I think we have hopes more if, if we can uh, educate our young women and also empower them. Next slide. So uh, we have talked about the demographic transition and it has not taken place in Pakistan, unfortunately. It will take place when uh, the birth rate comes down to touch uh, you know the, the death rate so the difference between the two rates is close to zero that's not going to happen in Pakistan in the near future the, if the, this demographic transition is stalled so if you see that in 1960s showing that the birth rate was 44 per thousand population and the death rate was about 21 the difference was about 23 and if you see in 2019 this is also World Bank data and uh, that uh, the birth rate is about 28 and the death rate is seven, the difference is about 21. So it's not really you know, uh, apparent that we are uh, starting, going to start our demographic transition as most of the other countries of the world have, uh, at least in our income groups and in our region. Next slide. This is the reason why, you know, because uh, if you try to look at 1990, 1990 was the year when our population program was already in uh, more than 20, 25 years, it was actually, you know, in place, so to speak, you know. So we had uh, uh, the first military dictator had actually supported family planning in the country introduce IUDs and all the country and uh, but unfortunately when in 1974 the first world fertility survey was done Pakistan has actually increased its fertility uh, level rather than decreasing so starting from 1990 if you see in 1990 you know the uh, uh, modern CPR which is MCPR here is only nine percent so and uh, it actually is, uh, increased very very slowly until 2013 I think the first jump was in 2007 demographic health survey, but then it actually started. I'll show you in the next slides. But since 2013, it has completely stalled. It's not actually going up at all. Even though we have very open-heartedly committed to the world that in ICPD 2019, uh, that we will uh, increase it to, I don't know, 55% or something, which is not likely at this stage. Next slide. 
uh, sorry, next, yeah. So this is a, a comparison of four DHS surveys which have happened in Pakistan. If you look at uh, the first two methods, uh, female sterilization and condom, these are the only ones which are the highest and have increased slightly and significantly at, le at least have jumped between 1991 and 2007. But the rest of the methods, uh, injectable pill and uh, IUD, you know, basically they have a slight increase between uh, 91 and 2007, but not, not really anything after that. What is wrong with female sterilization? Female sterilization typically happens when a woman already has five plus children. So in 1991, the median age at female sterilization was 6.5 children, sorry, medium uh, parity was 6.5 children. And in nine, uh, 2007, it was 5.5. Uh, uh, it has slightly decreased, but actually it has no demographic impact because the woman is already, you know, uh, almost past her reproductive age and she's uh, condoms uh, on the other hand you know they can be good if if they are used properly but they're not method failures are very high and they're not always available so if a woman tells a survey interviewer that we use a condom it doesn't mean that they use the couple use system every time they have uh, sexual intercourse so basically you know uh, this is also a very unreliable method for Pakistan, at least, you know, because availability and, you know, the quality and all that. And uh, the only hope we have actually was with injectable spills and implants. And uh, the implants are, have not taken off in Pakistan. And if, as you can see here, yeah, there's our next slide. I have tried to compare what is the global trends. Global means that it actually includes all countries of the world, poor and rich and all that. So basically you see uh, of 100 women who are using family planning method, a modern family, sorry, any family planning method, you know, a majority of them in Pakistan is using traditional methods. Next is condom and the third is uh, female sterilization and IUD implant and pills are very low. Male sterilization actually, you know, vasectomy does not exist in Pakistan. So while the, the rest of the world, you know, basically, you know, the, the emphasis is on IUDs and pills and injectables and condoms where, are, you know, they are used properly, you know, that's actually. So this is some kind of an anomaly in Pakistan that the method mix is not really correct method mix, which should be, uh, which is basically, um, it should have been, uh, uh, you know, short term and uh, temporary methods, which are, you know, easy to sell to the population and easy to like manage also. Next, next slide, please. And this is, this is a comparison of the sources of the uh, method again from DHS 2017. Uh, when they asked like, what was your source of your last method, uh, recent method? Uh, any modern method, so including uh, you know sterilization, IUD, and uh, uh, you know condoms and pills and injections. Uh, the majority of them went to the private sector, uh, but also like you know the the majority sorry went to the public sector here actually. And uh, because if you include the uh, the lady health workers and the government health facility, it comes to about uh, forty three. So. Uh, so it's kind of a 50-50, the NGOs are the social marketing agencies, so they count about 15%. Go to the next slide, please. Which is the source of condoms. So in this, you see that the majority of the, you know, private sector uh, is busy in providing condoms, you know. And Lady Health Worker also is a very successful, you know, a reasonable kind of like contribution to condoms. Next slide. And uh, comparing here the injections and the pills, and again, you know, the private sector provides uh, a lot of pills and some injections. Lady health workers are also like providing pills and injections and uh, government health facility again, you know, injections are more here and next slide. Um, but if you look at the sterilization on IOD, you see that the public sector health facilities are actually providing most of the you know bulk of these two methods, 56.8% uh, of the sterilization, about 62% of the IUD. The private sector is not really active that much in this sense. Next slide. So uh, what are the consequences, you know? 
these are just this is just a list which essentially is uh, i would say very obvious increase in poverty rates for example increase in crimes especially in urban areas those who, those of us who live in lahore and karachi we know about that uh, there is a really damage to social fabric you know the 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 families are divided you know uh, the male members of the family have to leave either go to the urban centers or abroad you know to the middle east for for earning uh, there is always political unrest associated with you know the major problems which are there there is polarization which we see in pakistan today there's every sector is showing and there are extremes of opinions in religious and ethnic and there's very little tolerance also you know there's political polarization we are witnessing it right now there's social polarization pakistan's health and nutrition indicators have been miserable actually and they are not increasing this morning i think that some somebody mentioned about neonatal uh, mortality rate uh, during a time period when pakistan had probably the strongest research on neonatal mortality our neonatal mortality rate had stalled for about 20 years at a very very high level there's also unemployment and uh, you know these are just the you know uh, sort of tip of the iceberg uh, um, consequences of population overgrowth next slide population density is something which i think we should understand what population density is if you have lived in uh, newly constructed housing societies around islamabad i think uh, probably most of them are illegal you you have probably witnessed that the farming land has reduced uh, the wildlife has been disturbed you know the people around uh, living uh, previously in those areas the villages have been displaced you know uh, so the population is increasing like a very high rate and if you see from 38 persons per square kilometer in 1951 now to you know 261 so a lot of like you know and most of the population of course is like in urban centers and uh, around it so and the urban centers are keep keeping increasing low like for example karachi and hyderabad are now almost touching each other uh, you know because population growth has been so much there are two huge uh, you know housing uh, projects going on between karachi and hyderabad the defense uh, health authority dha and the the bahria town karachi the famous and famous settlement which you know has displaced lots of villagers from there next slide so this is the story of karachi lahore and other urban centers and the increase has been very very fast it's a very rapid increase for karachi and uh, the last census counted it 15 million which was controversial and people say there's much more than that karachi's population was undercounted and all that but you know it has increased very fast and i will show you also other uh, you know consequences of the effects of the urbanization next slide for example this is called conurbation which is essentially you know when large uh, uh cities actually you know expand to touch and mingle uh, merge with each other so if you look at this slide which is uh, uh lahore which is i think number 2 here and shekhupur and kusur and uh, uh i think uh, hafizabad as well up to sargodha is basically one city is is converted into kind of like you know so it's a conurbation i like like uh, multiple cities like merging together when the cities are reaching out expanding outwards and touching each other you know a lot of other things are happening the locals in that area are being displaced uh, the the environment is being destroyed you know and we have witnessed that in this particular area next slide and the other example of urbanization is the mega city which is karachi and the population actually people uh, most people i would say experts including believe it's more than 25 million today and maybe more maybe even more than that uh, the rate of increase was about 6% per year uh, having uh, like uh, the the density in karachi mega cities on the average is 24000 persons per square kilometer and if you have uh, been to karachi lately you know that you know this is something which uh, is very visible kind of like traffic jams are very common you know the Uh, shanty towns if you visit them like the uh, lower middle income areas you know you will see that the population is really you know problem is everywhere 
Karachi is, uh, I think it was uh, three, four years ago, uh, designated as the world's uh, fifth largest city proper. That's one city, you know, with a very high population. It's expanding geographically as, as we discussed, you know, like in, in the form of like the DHAs and the barrier towns around it. And there's so many other housing societies and, but there are also shanty towns emerging and the old like goats and villages, they were there, they are converted into slum areas now because of the population overgrowth. Next slide. Is there one way to look at like uh, what consequences have uh, population has had? It's a what if question, you know. Pakistan was very in a, in a, in a very good place to work on uh, you know, population and uh, development during the 1950s and 60s when there's political turmoil and dictatorship did not focus on these things. So there are four things which I would say, if uh, in 1950s and 60s and even 70s, I would say, family planning program was sincerely and efficiently implemented and education was made compulsory and available to all citizens in urban and rural areas, you know, so, so as to make sure that 100% population was matriculate. And uh, higher education and skills trainings were made accessible at minimum expenses and uh, technological advancement of that time were incorporated into the education. So I was a child going to school during that time. I do remember that there were a lot of talk about all these things like uh, skills training was an in thing and uh, the newspapers like were shouting about how good the government was doing about it. And uh, there was also like, you know, bringing in family planning and all that. But the, unfortunately, problem is that in, in a country, we don't do what we say. We say a lot of things. We believe we are doing a lot of things. We are not doing actually. We are not actually doing them. So next slide. If that had happened in reality, Pakistan would now, and this is from regression models, could have achieved 1% or less population growth rate. I would say actually less than 1%. And today, the population would have been around 120 million, almost stabilized, you know, because we have had like 30 to 35 years, jail, one generation, you know, basically, of uh, family planning and population improvement. Uh, if our education was had worked well, you know, we would have a 100% secondary school education rate, that would have changed a lot of things. And about 50% of our population would have had like the young population uh, would have had some higher education and skills training. So this is exactly what has happened in other countries like Thailand, in South Korea, and uh, in Indonesia, you know, uh, that has changed those countries. They have actually transformed those countries. So we would have been ahead of South Korea, you know, Thailand, and Indonesia, and India even, you know, if we had used is to our demographic dividend. So our demographic dividend is basically when the, the, pop, the population rate, uh, sorry, the fertility rate goes down and uh, you know, the, there are not many in older people in the population. And the younger people who are dependent also like their, their proportion decreases. So there's a bulge in the population, which is young and working, workable. So working population, which exactly what happened in 10 countries of the Far East, you know, uh, including Thailand, South Korea, and Indonesia, et cetera. This could have happened also in Pakistan. Unfortunately, we, our, our education levels are so low that we, we, we really don't have any use for this uh, bulge of the younger population. Next slide. Quickly, some possible solutions that are pragmatic and they are like, you know, addressing the issues which are right now. I'm not talking about like bring in education and bring in like, you know, something which will take years and decades, you know. We can do immediately, we can shift our policy from, mess, uh, from passive to aggressive. It's simple basically because uh, we have been talking a lot. There have been a lot of talk of family planning in the last two years. I have actually seen much more activity but unfortunately, that activity at the highest level of the government, the president of Pakistan itself, the prime minister, you know, and you, you know, you name them, but that has not translated into bridging the gap in the supply chain of the uh, family planning methods in the public health sector, public sector, you know. 
Second thing which we could do is in, increase emphasis on rural areas. They have been neglected. You know, family planning programs are actually non-existent there, except for wherever there were lady health workers. But unfortunately, that program is also uh, deteriorating very fast. Enlisting men and religious leaders, it has not worked before in Pakistan, probably, you know, because of uh, uh, many uh, you know, programmatic faults, but I think they, still, you know, there's a potential there. If something is done properly and engage them, religious leaders, men, you know, in, into bringing them into the family planning consciousness, then I think uh, that might work. There's a need for market research, what the public wants, you know. Uh, do we know exactly, you know, what women and couples uh, prefer to use a family planning when they want family planning? You know, do they? Do we have that information? I'm not sure if we have uh, information from DHS has been properly analyzed so far, but you know, maybe we can look at you know whatever we have and maybe do some more research. Uh, I think promotion of vasectomy is uh, does have a potential. I don't know. I have said that before, and people say that uh, in Pakistan it may not be possible. But I think if uh, it once it catches up, I, I, I think it might have a potential and I think it, it may be a game changer. Uh, next is availability of emergency contraceptives. It should be very easily and uh, you know, uh, available to everyone. And we, we should invest in that because method failure, not availability of method at the right time is, is very, very common. So, and of course, you know, last but not the least, the complete integration of family planning into health. Uh, with uh, apologies to who my friends who are here from Publishing Welfare Department, PWD has contributed less than 3% of the, you know, according to last DHS uh, modern methods usage in Pakistan. So I think there is really no use uh, to have a separate department. Uh, family planning should be integrated in a you know proper way so that you know people actually you know the health department actually takes it over next slide this is the last slide i'm sorry if i'm running over but uh, i just thought i will bring this quote to you from uh, cohen's book the future of pakistan which was published by brooking institution press in i think 2011 and uh, I will read it to you. Half of all Pakistanis are below the age of 20 and two thirds of those have yet to reach their 13th birthday. Birth rate remains high even by regional standards. The population has tripled in less than 50 years, actually has quadrupled. Pakistan's demographic transition from high to low mortality and fertility has stalled, which is very obvious, you know. So I will leave you with this picture, which is like Pakistan, precarious, you know, not uh, following any safety rules. Uh, they are like, you know, they will probably reach their destination, inshallah, hopefully they will. But if they hit something, you know, it will be a disaster. I think our country is like that. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farid Vidit, for your presentation and also for presenting some of the harrowing consequences of our uncontrolled population growth and uh, the fact that we have increased six times since uh, our independence. And uh, we are all very perturbed by the fact that the population density and the urbanization and the and uh, the toll that the growth is taking on our uh, natural resources and its uh, you know non availability especially to the poorer segments of our society and uh, you have presented at the end uh, some of the possible solutions we've been just, you know utilizing all the forums possible to explain that these are the solutions but unfortunately i think that uh, the level of effort that should go in uh, to implement these solutions has not uh, taken place, uh, but still we remain hopeful and we hope that there are opportunities uh, still available to us and uh, simple solutions, but uh, easily doable. So thank you very much, Dr. Farid. We now move to our uh, second uh, panelist and this uh, our second panelist is Dr. Nasra Shah. She is a professor of migration and development. Uh, she was Professor of Demography at the Department of Community Medicine, uh, Faculty of Medicine, Kuwait University for about 30 years. Uh, Professor Shah received her doctoral degree in population dynamics from the John Hopkins University. She has worked in Hawaii, USA as well, and also the uh, Pakistan uh, Institute of Development Economics in Islamabad. 
her research has focused on various themes, including the role of social factors in infant and child mortality, predictors of fertility and contraceptive use, women's role and status, utilization of health services, and social and physical health of older persons. Um, uh, uh, she has also, uh, yeah, so the topic of her presentation today is on international labor migration for Pakistan, a safety wall, or a slippery slope. So over to Professor Nasra Shah. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Nasra, we can. Okay. Um, now, can, can you please put my PowerPoint on, please? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first of all, before I go to the presentation, uh, I would like to thank the FCC for arranging this conference uh, and to uh, Dr. Edelson for reminding me of those good days in Honolulu. Um, so, this morning, the, or this afternoon, uh, the topic that I'm going to deal with is international labor migration from Pakistan. And I'm going to deal with this by raising a question. Is it a safety valve or is it a slippery uh, slope? Uh, next, please. And uh, so I'm going to do this by looking at two main areas. Uh, I'm going to look at the trends and patterns of uh, outflows, outflows of labor migration from the country uh, and patterns related to that. And secondly, the trends in remittances. And then I'm going to uh, try to answer the question that I raised by looking at these uh, two main areas. Next. Okay. So, uh, if we look at the last decade or a, a little more, uh, what you see is that the numbers of labor migrants, and when I say labor migrants, I don't mean just laborers. This is worker migrants going uh, after registering with the government. So these are registered workers leaving the country between 2008 and 2021 is what I'm showing here until August. And uh, so one of the things that, that you know right away from this is that there are yearly, that this is not a steady number. It's not an upward line or a downward, but that there's lots of fluctuation. And particularly after uh, COVID uh, in uh, the figures, which were 625-203 in 2019, so more than 600,000 people uh, left the country in 2019, that suddenly then, and COVID was a main reason for that, uh, declined by about a third. Next slide. So. Uh, the figure that I just showed you, what are some of the key points from that? Some of the key points are that uh, there are major yearly fluctuations. And recently what we've seen is major downtrends, uh, which are, I guess, not unexpected because economies everywhere are slowing down. And so the demand for foreign workers is declining particularly in the Gulf, where most of our workers go, as I will uh, mention in a minute. I'll show you some data on that. Okay, so, but in 2015, uh, the number was as high as about 1 million. Um, and then big declines after that. So future is full of uncertainty. And there are many, many factors for this, including economic factors and non-economic factors, uh, some of which we've analyzed at, at the law school. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've been analyzing that. 
And among the non-economic factors, some of the ones that I would like to highlight are uh, the systems of governance in the host country, attitudes towards uh, migrant inflows that are changing and becoming more uh, hostile, let's say. So those are among some of the non-economic factors that are going to impact uh, uh, the future. Next. Okay, in terms of destinations, uh, next please. Yeah, so in terms of destinations, where do my they, uh, migrant workers, Pakistani migrant workers go? 85 to 90%. And if we look at the last decade, but if we go even further back, the picture is pretty much the same. That the two countries that really stand out as recipients of uh, Pakistani labor migrants are Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So um, next. In the last year, 2020, uh, uh, more than 60%, 61% of all migrants went to Saudi Arabia. Um, and 24% to the UAE. So between the two of them, they, that's the major story of where people go and where they send back uh, remittances from. Um, okay, now what does that mean? Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, okay, so Pakistan has been trying to diversify, and you'll hear this when people are talking of international migration, that uh, Pakistan has policies to diversify um, the destinations. Um, and so Malaysia, you see that lots of people, we, there's a feeling and a perception that lots of people are going to Malaysia. But when you look at that in terms of the percentage in 2020 who were going to Malaysia, that's only around 1%. And the majority of, are going to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Japan is one of the new countries, <clears throat> but again, the numbers going there are very, very small. Um, next. Okay, so the key points that I want to make in terms of destination is that there's extreme dependence on just two countries, which is fairly risky. Uh, with Saudi Arabia as the largest recipients. However, it's interesting to note that we have bilateral agreements with there's the, among the six Gulf Labor, uh, Gulf Cooperation Council countries, we have bilateral agreements with five of them. The only one that we don't have an agreement with is Saudi Arabia. <coughs> okay. Um, so, and also another thing worth noticing is that of all the deportees, for example, who came back from Saudi Arabia in 2017, um, a majority of them, large majority of them were from Saudi Arabia. So when I talk about risk, this kind of is one aspect of that risk. Um, and like I said, new destinations are getting a relatively small percentage of all the outflow. Next. Okay, next I want to look at the skill level. And uh, some of the speakers before me have talked about that. Uh, Dr. Midith just uh, mentioned that also. So let's look at what the skill level of the migrants who go out, what that skill level is. Next. Okay, now here what I've done is uh, there you have three groups. 
Uh, and these are data uh, from the government on the basis of their registration data for people who go through the government. And these data, by the way, uh, I have, um, it's, it's, it's good data. Uh, and everyone, because no one who is leaving can go without registration. So it's pretty complete. Um, so now, again, the take home from this is, if you look at focus just on 2019, uh, the percentage of unskilled that's in the gray bar was about half. And then some kind of skilled um, was 45%. And the blue bars are the highly, highly qualified and highly skilled. So consistently, that has remained very, very small. Generally, less than 10%, more like 5%. OK, next. Next chart, please. OK, uh, so in 2020, no, uh, go back, go back. OK. So the, in 2020, you see the same thing. Half of them uh, in unskilled and only about 4% as skilled. Now, so what's the take home from this? Can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide. OK. Um, yeah, and I wanted to emphasize that the, uh, the blue here is the laborers and the orange here are the drivers. So those are the two main occupations that, that uh, oh yeah, and um, I'll talk about gender in a minute. Okay, so uh, next slide. Now, regarding skill level, what are the key points that I want to make? The skill level of out migrants has not improved over the last several decades. Uh, now, why is that important? They're, they're sending back remittances just like everybody else. So why should I worry about that? I worry about that because lower skilled workers are more likely to face contract violations. Lower skilled workers are faced with poorer working and living conditions. And so in terms of migrant protection and some of the issues that were raised this morning, it's harder to uh, sort of regulate and manage and govern uh, lower skilled migration than uh, the migration of relatively better skilled persons who earn better wages anyway. And therefore in terms of remittances, probably they can contribute more. Next. Okay, in terms of place of origin, uh, next slide, slide please. Okay, uh, all parts of the country send uh, migrants. Uh, so the orange is Punjab being the largest district, it sends uh, the largest uh, number percentage. Uh, KPK, is unusual because compared to the proportion of population that lives in KPK, it sends a larger percentage of uh, workers than other regions. Okay, next. Okay, I said I would talk about gender. Now, in terms of everyone, uh, the labor migrants who go uh, primarily to the Gulf, as we saw, um, most of them are men. 99 point, uh, more than 99.5% of them are men. And historically, the government has not published data on this. It's for the first time that uh, they published some tables in their last annual report. And so that's where I got this from. So there were a total of 1,727 women in 2020 
And even though the numbers had gone down quite a lot, uh, we still sent about more than, uh, I mean, close to uh, 200,000. So women are a very, very, very small percentage of that outflow. Next. Okay, so back to my question, how much of a safety valve are annual outflows? Now, in order to answer that, let me show you a table next. Okay, so if I want to answer that question, I could look at what percent of the population are migrants. And so if you focus on the last column with the red numbers, so as a percent of the male population in 2017, because we have census data, so I can calculate these numbers. Um, so 0.43% of the out migrants uh, were as a percent of the male population, uh, out migrants constituted only 0.43%. Now in FATA, this percentage was higher and in KPK, the percentage was higher than uh, the rest of the country. So uh, like I had shown you earlier, so KPK uh, sends, uh, uh, will, would get impacted more when things change because they were sending larger percentages. Next. Okay, when we look at this as a percent of the labor force, which is a more meaningful number probably. Okay, still, um, in 2017, uh, total labor migrants constituted only 0.7% of the total. So uh, in terms, if uh, we were to say that uh, this is going to make a big contribution to taking the load of the labor force, okay, uh, then we have to keep this number in mind. Uh, next. Okay, now here's the rosier part of the story. So uh, can we see the next slide, please? All right. So when we go back to, yeah, we, when we look at the last uh, from July uh, 2019 to July 2021, when um, uh, like in part of this, the last part of this, uh, the outflows had really started going down. Uh, but what you see is that the remittances did not follow. The remittances kept on going up. And that has been a real lifesaver because remittances constitute about 7.2% of the GDP. Next. Okay, so as a percent of the GDP, that percentage has gone up too. When you look at this in a historical perspective from uh, 90 to fiscal year 1919. Okay, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. So having shown you the data, so let me come back to the question that I raised. So is labor migration a safety valve or is it a slippery slope? Okay, and my short answer to that is that it is really both of those. Uh, the declining trend in worker outflows is indeed worrisome but understandable. Now, the big question is whether, how quickly this is going to recover, how quickly this is going to go back to uh, maybe the 600,000 or maybe the even 1 million mark. Um, well, time will tell, but I'm skeptical that, though, that we are going to see those numbers again. Uh, the lack of skill improvement is a big concern. Um, 
And even though we have all of these facilities which are being added to in terms of the uh, training and vocational training centers in all the provinces, et cetera, uh, this is still not making very much of an impact on the annual outflows. And that needs to happen. So the, like, like I said before, the rise in remittances is a lifesaver. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, well, one of the reasons for that rise in remittances is that we've been able to capture a larger percentage of the remittances through official channels probably, because people were unable to send uh, through Hundi and Hawala. Um, so finally, the future will be determined by many economic as well as non-economic factors, some of which I mentioned earlier. Uh, so let me stop there and I'll be happy to take uh, questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nasr Sahaba, for that very <clears throat> thought-provoking uh, presentation. You have really pointed out some very important uh, pointers with regards to our immigrant workers, uh, especially the fact that remittances that we have rece received, especially during this uh, the pandemic period, have been a real lifesaver for Pakistan. Uh, we must uh, diversify the destinations of our immigrant workers. And I think in that uh, connection, our foreign office and our embassies must play a very important role in identifying the labor markets uh, where our workers can be in, uh, in brought in. Um, I think the Philippines uh, took a great uh, initiative many years ago when they started planning where the, 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 the uh, planning and you know identifying the countries where their labor could uh, find jobs and especially they uh, really looked uh, worked on Japan and uh, prepared uh, workers that Japan would be needing uh, in the years to come and so they focused on uh, preparing healthcare workers which now uh, the Philippine health workers are you know finding jobs in many parts of the world. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, in order to enhance the monetary value of our remittances, we should really be focusing on exporting skilled labor force and that to develop the skilled labor force is definitely a challenge, as you've said. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions which we will be able to, uh, to uh, take uh, at, at the end of this uh, panel discussion. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Nasr Shah. Uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Ms. Shanaz was the Lisaiba, Satara Imtiaz. Ms. Shanaz is the president of Zabist and also holds the honorary position of provincial coordinator for the government of Sindh Oversight Committee on Family Healthcare and Family Planning. She's also a member of the Chief Minister of Sindh's Task Force on Polio. Uh, Madam Shanaz holds a master's degree in education from the University of Arkansas and also um, a higher training in education administration from Trenton College. Uh, Madam Shanaz Wazir Ali has had an illustrious career spanning 40 years as an educationist, social sector and development policy specialist. She was a member of the Pakistan People's Party, twice elected to the National Assembly of Pakistan. Twice she has been special assistant to the Prime Minister on social sector. Uh, she is very well known uh, women's rights activist. She has served as a senior education specialist from the World Bank. And held, the, and held the position of Minister of State for Education in the government of Pakistan. She is on the board of a number of prestigious national and international organizations. Uh, she is recognized for her significant contributions in the health sector, which include the concept, design, planning, and implementation of Pakistan's largest primary health care initiative, which was the Prime Minister's Family Planning and Primary Health Care Program. Uh, so over to Madam Shanaz Wazirali, who will be talking to us about the issues of population, education, and workforce. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali Mir. And I'd like at the outset uh, to thank uh, the organizers of this uh, extremely valuable, substantial, informative uh, panel discussion and the academic conference uh, this 
collaboration between PRC, FCCU, um, hosted actually by FCCU Population Council, uh, led by Dr. Seva Satar, and FPA, HEC. Uh, this is an amazing constellation of um, organizations, uh, national academia is represented as well as international experts and international agencies. There have been such remarkable presentations um, by uh, Dr. Farid Nidat and uh, Dr. Nasra Shah, just now is listening very carefully to the issues on migrant um, trends, as well as uh, a very composite uh, analysis of the sector by Farid Nidat and certainly Dr. Gavin Jones, Dr. Zeba Shah and um, Dr. Eric Fong have also illuminated, I think, the discussion considerably. So um, a great deal of what I was going to say has been covered in many presentations, but let me just move on to uh, just highlight once again uh, what the data tells us and where we stand. And then I will really move to what is really the deeper uh, set of issues and and the deeper set of discussions that we need to engage in. Next, please. These pictures just show you a range of our young population. And also when I'm going to be talking about the labor market, um, and labor workforce, women in particular, and what Pakistan is really providing, in fact, is not providing to its population in terms of making them skill-based for the current and contemporary economy, not only of Pakistan, but also to look at what global economies need in terms of workforce, skilled workforce. So most of these pictures show you that we really are still largely semi-skilled or unskilled in terms of the large numbers of our workforce. Next. So the population estimates, um, and this is all this, uh, the only set of issues around data, how reliable is it? And can we go with one set of figures or not? So in a sense, one is compelled to go by uh, what is produced by the government and the national estimates show us that we had about 215. In the last census, this is a disputed figure. Uh, there has been a lot of debate around the census and uh, whether it was actually conducted perfectly and technically, whether it is reliable enough. And the UN estimates us to be at about uh, 225. Whatever it is, we're on the uh, on a rising trend here, which is actually the increasingly disturbing factor. And Dr. Farid Neda told us exactly how dangerous the scenario is going to look in 2047. Let's move on. Next. Okay, the composition is here. Again, all the experts listening in are very familiar with this. Um, we've not been able to dramatically change uh, uh, this, uh, this demographic profile <clears throat> in terms of ensuring that if we have a larger working age population and a larger population that is requiring education, is the system really providing that? So while we talk about 64, 65% of our population being under the ages of 30, and then as you can see, the education uh, for children, early primary education for 13% of our population is virtually non-existent. State schools do not really provide early childhood programs. Uh, private sector does to some extent, but this is, I think, a very critical, big gap in Pakistan's education provision that the early age entry into skills, uh, early childhood skills, water coordination, and also learning and nurturing environments for our children are really not provided. From age five to 14 is a big chunk of our population. And if you put both of these chunks together, it constitutes about 36%, which is a very large percentage of our population. And, uh, significant percentage of them are out of school. And worse still, those that are in school are actually not achieving the learning levels that they need to, and nor are school conditions 
relevant to the needs of the students nor fully supplied, neither in terms of the quality of teachers, nor physical facilities, nor enrichment or supplement, a supplement to the education, not, I'm not talking about food supplements, but curriculum supplemented and enriched. So many deficits exist in the education sector. And this is the population, this 36%, that uh, is actually indicating to us as it gets older why it is not ready to enter uh, even a, a skilled or a, or a semi skilled uh, labor workforce. Because, as you know, the workforce starts from the age of 15 on to 64. Another critical uh, age is uh, 15 to 29. And as you can see, that this is a very large chunk of our population here. So altogether, these, if you look at these numbers, it just gives you a sense of the scale. And uh, let's move on, and I will indicate to you then how the system is actually not responding to this sort of a demographic profile. Uh, poverty is impacted enrollments. Poverty is impacted uh, retention in schools. Poverty has impacted the ability of students to learn. Cognitive uh, development has been uh, affected. There's cognitive retardation. Uh, there is physical uh, malnutrition and uh, low weight babies and underweight as well as low height. Uh, so the physical features of our young population, which are a consequence of the poverty line, uh, impact uh, just about everything and one of the things that they impact of course most dramatically is how the children uh, learn and we have seen that again and again in learning and achievement surveys and the one most regularly conducted is by the annual survey on education in Pakistan which shows that our children in class three four and five uh, cannot either do mathematics or uh, in language skills or in any of the other subjects at the level of their own grade. They are all two to three grade levels lower. So achievement levels are exceedingly low and that's a factor of poverty as well as a factor of the uh, poorly functioning uh, state systems as well as many other private school systems. Here, if you look at 1.9 million, uh, uh, sorry, 1.9 dollars a day, uh, which translates into something, uh, I think, into 200 and some rupees if you take the dollar rate today of 170, 75 or so. So this is minimum poverty line, 1.9 dollars per day. We put two million people below the poverty line. Now these two million people are not going to be able to enter the school. These two million people are, uh, and this is not just children, uh, this is two million people altogether, but this is the number of people affected. And then if you can translate that into the families and the younger children in the family who should be getting adequate nutrition and being in a condition to go to school. So this, that's not happening at all. And in fact, <clears throat> the poverty has increased for this Poverty line, $1.9 a day has actually increased. Next. If you look at the lower middle income level poverty rate, which is $3.2 a day, uh, this is also indicating that the poverty ratio is pretty high. It's disturbingly high, 39.3. And there's not been much difference between 2021, 20, 21, 22 projections. So the population that is at uh, at the in the poverty line, which is drawn for lower middle income, is also indicating that there are there's no movement out of poverty, out of that segment of the poverty cohort or poverty population. Next, at five point five dollars a day, uh, the poverty ratio is about seventy eight percent. And the projections also don't change it by much, just by 0.1 percentage point. So what does this overall picture show us? Um, it, it shows significantly large sections of our population that are still living under the poverty line, whether it's 
1.9, whether it's 3.2, 5.5 dollars a day. And this is an indicator of the economic inability, of the inability of the economic system uh, to provide jobs, to provide um, upward financial mobility, and to provide the type of opportunities which moves people out of poverty. We've been talking about and hearing about the SRS program, and initially that was the Bain Aziz Income Support Program, which really was an income transfer program. It is really not a poverty alleviation program. And I think this is something that we all need to look at again, because poverty impacts just about all the decisions, decisions about education, decisions about work, size of family, sending, uh, uh, seeking uh, family planning services, seeking health services, uh, every behavioral uh, reflection of families living under the poverty line indicate uh, that they're in a state of crisis. And today with the very rising rate of uh, CPI, the consumer price index going up almost every day, I think these poverty ratios are going to show us a much more distant picture. And this, the economy is certainly not providing this, the support from uh, generating enough investment, through investment, generating enough jobs. And I do want to underline that uh, just straightforward social protection programs, uh, just protect people temporarily, do not trans lift them out of a particular uh, uh, band of poverty. So next, let's take a look at, uh, next please. Um, the World Bank is showing the trend is rising, just 4.4 to 5.4. In terms of numbers, it translates into a large number of people. The government of Pakistan says something uh, which is directly opposed to what the World Bank is showing. And it, it is claiming that poverty has actually declined. Uh, so uh, I think that I'm not too sure about what, how much reliability on data that there is. Uh, but there is enough other evidence to indicate that poverty has not declined, that in fact poverty is increasing. Next. So uh, this is all reflected in the gross enrollment rate to the primary level. This is something I mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, gross, point, uh, gross enrollment levels, as I think everyone here knows, reflect the total number of students in classes one to five here in this case, but it does not, it is not a relevant reflection. Uh, what really we need to look at is if you can just keep this slide in mind that the total uh, percent of uh, students are 84% who are registered of that age group in classes one to five. Now let's go to the next one, which really shows you the actual picture. This is the net enrollment rate. So it's not 89%, it's 64% of those who are in the appropriate age group who should be going to school. Uh, and you can see how uh, the numbers drop when you move from primary to secondary. Drastic drop, absolutely. Retention is a very major problem. Attrition is high. Multiple reasons for why attrition is high and why students drop out. So when we are talking about skilling our workers, when we are talking about labor force participation, and Dr. Nastasha gave amazingly uh, you know, clear uh, pictures and data sets which talked about our migrant labor that's going abroad. So migrant labor going abroad is uneducated largely and unskilled and therefore goes primarily for the lower end jobs for laborers, for drivers, and for the lower end jobs, because your education system is showing you that the majority of children drop out after primary. Very few get to secondary. And if you can see, the female ratios are also much lower in every case. Next. So this is learning poverty, which I was talking about earlier, that while children are in school, is that a sufficient indicator? Certainly it is not. And it's been for a long time that many of us have been advocating, it has been some decades now, that please do not just look at enrollment levels 
or even retention levels, but please look at achievement levels. What sort of acquisition is taking place in terms of knowledge and skills? And the acquisition of learning is very, very poor compared to all other countries in our region. Pakistan is at the bottom of the list. Uh, these big figures are really stark and they are very painful. So you can see that uh, students cannot read to Urdu even though they are in class five. They cannot read level two English sentences even though, when they are in class five. And similarly, cannot do two digit division in arithmetic in large numbers. You can see the numbers, they are right before you. So learning achievement is very low, which basically means that the systems, largely the state system, are not achieving um, what they're actually meant to do. They're meant to educate and uh, to, to provide students with the necessary education skills. Next. Next. Uh, in addition to that, we have about 22.8 million out of school. Children, this figure is a bit dis disputed. There is another figure which says 23.7 million. This is a staggering number of children out of school. So when I let's connect some of these links now. We talk about women empowerment, women entering the workforce, uh, women having the ability to make decisions about their, the size of family and other household decisions women marrying at a later age, women spacing their children, all of these are factors of, of, of proper schooling. Uh, not only primary and secondary and actually acquiring the skills, acquiring the knowledge, but even beyond secondary, I would go so far as to say that post-secondary education is absolutely vital. And I'll come in a minute to what type of secondary and post-secondary education is required. But here is a cohort of our a young population, 32% that are actually out of school, or they have some of them have dropped out of school. So this very large, staggering number, what is their future? How are they going to engage in the appropriate decisions? So I began beginning to think increasingly of the fact that we in Pakistan cannot wait until all children are in school and all are well-educated and well-skilled, but we really need to move very rapidly towards communication, information, advocacy uh, for this large uh, cohort of more than 23, 24 million children, as well as the others who will not be able to handle uh, decision-making when they are young adults. And the education system is not doing it for them. So we have to go beyond the formal education systems. Next. There are, of course, at the university level, as you can see, a very large number of universities in Pakistan, increasingly in the private sector. Let me just show you the total numbers in university. Next. It's only, next slide, please. Oh, I think I should have had another slide there, which said there are only about 1.9 million students in our universities in Pakistan. So to end up in universities. The working age population is considered to be, uh, at, or is pitched at 153 million. These are numbers that are coming out of the World Bank and also out of the Economic Survey of Pakistan. And you can see the breakdown between male and female. Everywhere, of course, uh, the females are, uh, percentage-wise, a uh, little lower than the real age. Uh, the urban-rural shift is very dramatic, also in many places in, across Pakistan. Uh, cities are the magnet where people think they can get better livelihoods. Uh, so uh, a large number of families shift, and there's huge internal migration from rural to urban areas. Right now, of course, it shows you 94.1 million people in the rural areas and 59 and urban, but these are uh, ratios that have changed dramatically over the years. There were only about 20 million people, 20% uh, of the population in urban cities in Pakistan, and 80% was in the rural areas. Now the shift is something like 
57 or 58 percent are in urban areas, 58 percent of the population urban areas, very urban or semi-urban areas. Next. This is the number of people, uh, young people speak, seeking employment, which is a pretty large number. And uh, it has increased. That shows the economy is not generating the jobs for these uh, at all, that the jobs that the economy wants meaning the industry, services, trade, logistics, agriculture sector, construction, any sector that you look at. They need certain types of skills which are not available and the young people are seeking jobs. So this mismatch of skills just continues. I don't think any of this is particularly new, but the reason I'm presenting it here again is that we have just not been able to make a dent in this profile of producing young men and women from the education or technical training programs who are not suited for the types of jobs that the market is, is coming up with. So this mismatch of skills is becoming even more acute. It is even more acute today. Next. This is the total, total labor force of 68.75. This is the labor force, which is in the age group. Of 15 to 64, out of which 64 million are unemployed. Uh, 4.71 million are unemployed and 64 million are employed. So now this is that same figure of the unemployed. Who are they? Why are they unemployed? Uh, because they don't have the skills that the market needs and also they don't have the financial uh, credit systems available to them and they continue to be unemployed. I just move faster because I think I'm taking a fair amount of time here. Let's go to the next one because I just want to come to a set of important questions at the end. Um, this is the unemployment rate. I think most of you are fairly familiar with it. High unemployment even in the urban areas as well as rural areas. Um, female unemployment, of course, is the highest. Next. This is the sector breakdown of, of employment, uh, mostly agriculture, services 37, industry 23. Uh, Pakistan is supposed to be a, an agriculture country as its spine of production, uh, but we have seen what has been happening in the agriculture sector recently. What is the largest growth area in Pakistan today is the IT sector. Uh, it is not agriculture, it is no other industry, it's not in other services, or, but it is the IT sector, and then linked to that are the services provided to the IT sector. Uh, formal economy only includes 27.6% of the informal economy, 72%. Now, what do many of these numbers indicate? When you translate these into household, community, husband and wife, decision making, empowerment, uh, you can see that unless uh, the family, or the household income earner is well skilled, well educated, has access to credit, is relevant to the job market, they can't make the decisions that they need to make for their own uh, family to improve uh, their family conditions. And all of that is related ultimately to decisions about and behavior change about family size decisions. Next. Average monthly wages are absolutely ridiculously low, but that's part of the economy of Pakistan. Uh, recently, the government has increased the minimum wage to 25,000 for minimum wage workers, and provincial governments are being hard pressed to actually meet that out of their budgets. Next. Next. Thank you. Um, I'm not giving you a pathway forward. Can we? Uh, what I'd like to just put before our colleagues today is that there's a lot of data that you know. We've seen a lot of data that has come before. Um, can we continue to do the same things and pause it the same uh, appro approaches? strategy at family planning, 
and addressing population issue. Now we know that it is, and Dr. Zeva enlarged upon that and expanded, and so did Dr. So did all the speakers. Uh, that there's a multiplicity of factors that affect the decisions that are made about family planning and reproductive health. It is not just supply side. Uh, it has a great deal to do with the empowerment factor. And the empowerment factor connects with financial empowerment. It also is affected by cultural barriers to, emp to empowerment. But women's empowerment lies at the heart of behavior change at the family level. Evidence has shown that again and again in many societies. Bangladesh has brought about the big change through inducting large numbers of women into the workforce. Indonesia and Malaysia have done that much earlier. Japan and Korea adopted the technical skills model and, and promoted equal access to technical training programs, the TTP, is an extremely effective program of Korea. And the ITP is an extremely effective program of that, which is the industrial technical training programs. So empowerment of women, financial empowerment of women, decision-making uh, roles of women to be recognized with family needs to, she needs to be financially empowered. She may not be, and she's not going to be for a long time, the current cohort of young girls in schools are not going to make it significant percentage is not going to make it to secondary school and neither to uh, college and universities. So we have to find and support strategies that reach out to women in particular to empower women with skill sets, knowledge base and workforce opportunities. And it has to be within Pakistan because the migration trends show there is not mostly women that are migrating for women are many school percentage. So their work and their opportunities have to be Pakistan based. And I, I think increasingly I come to this question that government needs to lead on the development side on the investment side for opening up jobs for women. Once they're empowered, they will make decisions about their families which will be more in line with uh, creating a balanced population profile, demographic profile for Pakistan. So thank you very much, Dr. Elie, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Shanaz Razid Ali, for this very thought-provoking and very valuable uh, presentation. And um, you've really very nicely linked the whole issue of population size, poverty, schooling, employment, and women empowerment. And we, we recognize that in Pakistan, actually, poverty is not only increasing, but it is the, at, the, at the back of all the problems that we are confronted with. We, we do understand and realize that uh, poor families have larger uh, family size, have less savings, and less ability to be able to access education and healthcare, and also to get the kind of skills to graduate out of poverty. But having said that, at the same time, they also have high unmet need for family planning. So to, in order to help people graduate out of poverty, we will have to focus on family planning. But as you've rightly pointed out, that behind that women empowerment plays a very crucial and important role, which then again is linked to schooling, education, and skills. So thank you very much, Madam Shanaz. Uh, now we'll move to the next uh, uh, presentation, and our next panelist is Mr. Mukadir Shah. Uh, Mr. Mukadir Shah is currently working with the United Nations Population Fund as program analyst in the area of population and development. He has over 20 years of diverse experience in project management, planning, and implementation, uh, population and development statistics, data collection, analysis, and projection. Uh, monitoring and evaluation, gender issues and policy analysis. Uh, previously, he worked with the International Rescue Committee as a protection manager and with the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. He joined the UNFPA in 2008 as a census coordinator and played a key role in coordinating with the development partners, UN agencies and government of Pakistan in mobilizing the resources, which led to the sixth national census of Pakistan 
Uh, since 2013, he is leading the population and development section of UNFPA. Uh, Mr. Mukadar Shah will be speaking on the high population growth rate and its linkages with development sectors, including economy, climate change, and women empowerment. So over to Mr. Mukadar Shah, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali Mir, uh, for the invitation and the brief uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend our uh, heartiest congratulations to Population Research Centers, the organizers, the whole team for organizing this uh, wonderful virtual seminar and connecting experts across Pakistan internationally as well. Uh, and PRC is moving, uh, moving forward successfully uh, with its set goals. And those are the, and these are the milestones that UNFPA wanted to see uh, in terms of growing. Uh, it is also required in terms of sustainability and knowledge sharing in the best interest of addressing population issues in the country. Can you, uh, can you please uh, show the presentation? Just take a few seconds, sir. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my presentation is mainly, in fact, from uh, the population situation analysis that was undertaken in 2020. Uh, in uh, collaboration with the Ministry of Planning, Development and Special Initiatives, a number of international and national experts, they were part of this uh, huge, uh, uh, huge exercise. This includes Professor Gavin Jones, who is also part of this conference, uh, Dr. Hossein Sayed from Cairo University, David Kenning, Dr. Iqbal Shah from Harvard University, Dr. Arif, uh, who is the president of PAP uh, at the moment, and along with other uh, national experts. Uh, firstly, I would like to go, next slide, please. First, uh, I would like to highlight some of, uh, some of the opportunities. In fact, uh, at the highest level, if you see, it has been recognized that rapid population growth is an obstacle to achieving Pakistan goals of sustained human and economic development, the national task force has been formulated, an action plan with objectives of reducing the population growth rate from 2.4% per annum to 1.5% per annum by 2024 and 1.1% per annum by 2030. How is this to be done? The mechanism is to be rise the contraceptive prevalence rate 50% by 2025 and 60% by 2030, leading to a lowering of total fertility. Total fertility rate 2.8 by 2025 and 2.2 by 2030, and this has been agreed in the Task Force on Population and Development. Next slide, please. Uh, the first to accelerate the demographic transition, which is more important in reducing both mortality and fertility rates, and does, and does yielding a potential demographic dividend. This can be facilitated by Pakistan emphasis on and poverty, and poverty alleviation and the social equity. With respect to sustainable development goals and the SAS program, the sustainable development goals are all interrelated and success in achieving the SDGs will facilitate the deceleration of the population growth. As far as the SAS program, it has the potential to improve the circumstances of the most disadvantaged sections of the community. These are the groups in the society with the highest infant mortality rate and the highest fertility rates, the earliest child marriage and the poorest level of education. If through SARS, the circumstances can be improved, this will counter their social disadvantage and make it more likely that their living will be improved. 
Next, please. The slide shows that the population growth rate remaining very rapid. There has been enormous population increase since 1981. If you look at those last three columns, the 1981, 98, and 2017, the population of Pakistan in those years, and the rate of growth remained very high as shown by the line in the graph. The fact is that Pakistan is outlier in Asia and in the Islamic world in its high rate of population growth rates. Next, please. If you look at this slide, this is the finding from uh, the population situation analysis. Over the next 20 years, Pakistan is projected to aid more than half of its current population. This is almost twice the increase projected for Bangladesh and Iran, and it is three times the increase in Sri Lanka and Egypt, and eight times the increase in Turkey and Tunisia. Next, please. The need, there is a need to lower the fertility rate rapidly while fully respecting couple rights to choose how many children to have. Low fertility will lead to slow a population growth and beneficial changes in the age structure, leading to so-called a demographic dividend. So that's how we can reap the benefits from the demographic dividend if we lower our fertility rate. The question is, how can fertility be low? There is a demand side and supply side aspect of this. On the demand side, we have to recognize that Pakistan is still having an ideal family size of four children. Those with a secondary and higher education have low fertility and low desired family size, but not as low as needed to achieve the displacement level of the fertility. So this need to be focused uh, in those particular areas. So we need to consider what can be done to ensure that Pakistani couple moves to an objective of having fewer children of providing wealth for their need. Next, please. We believe that the key challenge in moving the situation our force need to lower the infant and child mortality rates. Then the need to rapidly increase educational enrollment ratio, especially for girls and to improve the quality of education. And the need to widen opportunities for women's full participation in the economy and more generally to counter gender equality. These development have wide, wide implications for social, for societal change and are key and are likely to lead lower desired family size. Next, please. If you look at this graph, the graph shows that the female labor force participation rates in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, the female labor force participation remain very low in Pakistan. It's actually now much the same as in India. In India, yeah, it has dropped in recent years, but both of them, Pakistan and India, they are far below from Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, and even further below countries such as Indonesia, which is not shown in, the, in this graph, where more than half of the women in the workforce compared with 20% in Pakistan. Next, please. Uh, this is a uh, the slide, in fact, uh, that is linking population with gender equality. Pakistan, you can see Pakistan ranks very poorly on indices of international differences in the gender inequality. There are a number of them, but just one of them is given here. Pakistan is the second most unequal in Asia according to the gender inequality index, and it is a second from the top of. This reflects how should it be addressed that must be taken if Pakistani women are to be empowered to fulfill their potential. Next, please. Now, just look at this this uh, this table. 
the difference between Pakistan and every other country in the table in terms of development indicators. The death indicators, the health indicators, the fertility, the contraceptive prevalence, female labor force participation, and education in Pakistan. All of these, in all of these indicators, Pakistan lagged behind the other countries in the region. And particularly in education, enrollment rates are much lower. Under farm mortality rate is much higher compared to these comparable countries. And as we have seen, a low ratio of working age to dependence. And I think a key point is that these are not isolated statistics. All of these factors are interrelated. The low rate of education is leading to a high level of fertility. But those high level of fertility means it's a very hard to give a high quality education because of large number of children in each youth cohort. The health, education, and economic factors are contributing to the slow fertility decline. And the slow fertility decline is in turn contributing and holding back these all other indicators. So I would say that it is important that we don't think of development as one thing. I think all of these factors have more or less, uh, they have to move together and population issues have to be addressed together with addressing education, health, and economic questions. So populations, handling population in isolation will not resolve the issues. So we have to link the population with all other development indicators in terms of the development. Next slide, please. There are two fundamental challenges. In fact, if you look at the slide, one is, can Pakistan speed the fertility transition and get a faster increase in the working age share? More women willing to answer the labor force and the potential for an economic takeoff? But harnessing, that is going to be a major challenge for Pakistan, as one of the issue is that the ratio is shifting in the favor of Pakistan, but there is an issue that are very large inflows. There are about 4 million young people entering the work age group page each year. May I continue? Yes, please do, sir. So, so there are about 4 million young people entering the working age group each year. And there has a, an outflow of people aging out, people aging into a retirement but less than 1 million. So there is a net increase in the working age population of Pakistan over 3 million. It's a very large increase in fact, and that increase has to be absorbed into the labor force in Pakistan. And what it is lead to is there is some unemployment in Pakistan, but a more major problem is it forces a people into a low productivity sector. So it's a job on the created the force into a low productivity sectors, and there are barriers to female labor force participation. And the low level of child health education and then working productivity and make it more difficult to absorb this huge labor force. The low saving and investment rates, and there are a large number of migrants workers. In the data, the migrant workers reduce the working age population, but in fact, they are quite a good, good things because they work abroad and remit their earning back to Pakistan. And so major, major sources of foreign earning for Pakistan. But, but that flow has also been reduced recently, particularly with the onset of this COVID-19, which, which, which has in fact affected a number of countries, including Pakistan. Next slide. So water has also, population is also a deep linkages with the climate change. There are a number of challenges. If, if I consider it, if I go through all of this, which has been highlighted in the population situation analysis, it might, at the time might not permit me, but I have taken only one slide out of this, uh, which is uh, the water scarcity uh, in connecting uh, the population's issue. The Pakistan uh, 
if you look at Pakistan water insecurity is very deeply linked to the growth in population. Despite high dependence on groundwater, per capita water availability in Pakistan has gone down sharply from 5,260 cubic meter in 1951 when the population was 34 million to 1,000 cubic meter in 2020 when population is now more than 220 million and it's and is expected to be around 550 cubic meter by 2025. Yet based on population projection, water demand will go up from 109 million acre feet in 2017 to 124 million acre feet by 2030. And the expert have pointed out that as precipitation pattern shift, temperature rise, drought occurs, and irrigation is rise due to evaporation, and the amount of fresh water availability per person will further decline this water level in Pakistan. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. Uh, this slide most talk about the policy recommendations highlighted again by the population situation analysis. The main point is the proposed system recommendations and to speed the demographic transition in Pakistan through reducing fertility level and reaching a balance between population growth and environmentally sustainable social and economic development. That should be consistent with the national narrative on population growth. But we have to emphasize here that this set of recommendation is not limited to a family planning and reproductive health, it aims to consider the population problem in a comprehensive approach. The policy recommendations covers many areas, and some of these areas have been highlighted over here. And I have just uh, uh, highlighted the key areas where the recommendation has been made in the population situation analysis, but for more detail, uh, the population situation analysis report is available with UNFP and, uh, you, and anybody can access that report. Just send me an email. I'll share, I'll share the, the hard copy or the soft copy uh, for further uh, to see the further recommendation within each of these areas that have been deeply linked uh, with, the, uh, with the population's uh, high population growth rate. Next. So this is the, the, uh, uh, the front page of the population situation analysis. It can be accessed even uh, 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 through Google, or uh, even if uh, you can send me an email. So thank you very much. I stop here. Uh, thank you very much, Mukadar uh, Shah uh, We are, uh, you know, uh, indeed very uh, grateful and thankful to UNFPA for uh, uh, supporting the establishment of the population resource centers. Uh, we, we are very happy to report that uh, these centers have now been established in all four provinces of Pakistan. And as you can judge from the event that has been organized today, all these centers are playing a very important and critical role in not only conducting uh, demographic research, but also disseminating research and also uh, bringing to uh, together uh, population experts uh, to deliberate upon the important issues that are confronted in Pakistan with regards to our uh, increasing population. So thank you very much, uh, Mukhada Saab. You really highlighted some of the very stark indicators uh, that, we, that uh, Pakistan has and how we have become an outlier uh, in the region since we are lagging behind most of the other countries in our social indicators. And as you rightly pointed out, that these indicators are all linked, and uh, and fertility it plays a very important role in uh, in improving or uh, in uh, an important role in, in bringing about improvement in these social indicators. And for that reason, we must have a multi-sectoral uh, approach uh, looking at uh, the population issue, uh, uh, and rather not uh, limiting our uh, focus on only uh, population welfare departments, but rather looking at the role of other departments that can contribute to bringing our fertility down. Uh, 
So with this, now we come to the last, uh, but not the least, uh, uh, our panelist for today is Ms. Uh, Saima Bashir. She is a senior research demographer at the Pakistan Institute of Demo Development Economics. Uh, Ms. Saima Bashir is currently working as a senior research demographer. Uh, she also serves as the head of social dynamic unit. Uh, she received her PhD in sociology from the Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Um, she, she has been trained as a demographer and a sociologist. And her line of uh, research examines the marriage market in Pakistan uh, and how uh, marriages are being influenced uh, the repro uh, and the reproductive uh, decision-making taking place in Pakistan. Uh, uh, she, in uh, all her research, she pays, uh, pays close attention to gender and socioeconomic differentials uh, to understand people's or uh, couples or women's reproductive decision making. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Sama Bashir will be today speaking on uh, by raising a question, who wants a child? Couples, fertility preferences, women's education and contraceptive use in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Sama Bashir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali Mir. Thank you so much. Um, and first of all, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Vakas, the Director of Population Research Council at uh, FCC University for inviting me. And it's a great honor for me to share uh, this uh, distinguished forum with all the uh, distinguished uh, presenters. Um, and it was a great learning experience for me. So today, um, uh, I just changed a little bit topic of my presentation. I'm going to talk about reproductive behavior in Pakistan and uh, incorporating men and couples to understand change over time. So uh, like scholarship on reproductive attitudes and behavior has long recognized the importance of both partners, fertility intentions and desires. Uh, for fertility behaviors. Uh, for instance, in 1970s, Fried noted that models that incorporated both uh, husband and wife's intention uh, more strongly predicted subsequent fertility behavior of the couple than models with only one uh, partner's intentions. And that conclusion is mirrored in work from other countries, such as Taiwan, where they also found that husbands and wives frequently have different fertility attitudes that affect their uh, consequent fertility behaviors. Um, and as we all know that decision to have a child is essentially a didactic matter. Both husband and wife um, has uh, the role to play in it. However, uh, conventional fertility analysis assumes women's responses about the frequency and timing of childbearing are more accurate than the men's report as they are actual bearer of, the, um, of children. Um, in countries where most fertility is marital, Wives usually report fertility data, and the data on dates of birth and number of children collected from wife's port is largely assumed to be identical for husband. Uh, but this can't be true, particularly for more subjective fertility-related information, such as intentions. Mm, uh, because, uh, and this is more true in uh, traditional societies, such as Pakistan, because we have observed, and many studies have shown, that men's disproportionately influence the fertility behaviors and women's inability to translate their own fertility intentions to behavior. Uh, and that is evident uh, through different studies. Still a lot uh, uh, um, still uh, um, uh, uh, to date, um, uh, family planning research as well as policy formulation has largely focused on women and ignoring men and couples. And uh, this is continues to day. Uh, however, spousal agreement on fertility intention is not in, um, is inevitable. Some level of spousal agreement on uh, fertility intentions, um, uh, there could be many reasons. Um, some are men and women uh, may not necessarily share the same fertility attitudes and goals, uh, particularly true in societies marked with higher gender segregation where husband's fertility desire and attitudes takes precedence. Um, moreover, fertility intentions are not static and are reassessed over the individual life course with the changes in the economic and social standing of the family. Um, and during the fertility uh, transition, uh, scholarship has shown that women's desire for larger families may decrease more quickly than men's. Uh, and moreover, spousal disagreement on fertility intention is 
is important because it may be indicated of women's empowerment though i suppose it go, could go both ways uh, more disagreement if women feel like they can express their own opinions versus less agreement if men and women are discussing their preferences like the spousal communication is going on so uh, the important question that raises is that how fertility decisions are made in case of disagreement so the research is um, inconclusive on this aspect. Uh, studies from the developed world usually shows that wife's characteristics have greater influence than husband characteristics. But in um, um, less developed countries, um, a husband characteristics, particularly attitudes towards contraception, strongly influence the wife's attitude towards contraception, but not vice versa. Uh, for instance, one study done in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in 2005 observed that husband's education strongly influenced wife's intention to stop childbearing than her own education. Uh, to, so this is just to set the stage. Um, um, my study is based on Pakistan, and as we all know that Pakistan is the fifth most populous country in the world. And with respect to its familial structure and fertility, it's a patriarchal society where men play a major role in decision making, including the reproductive ones. And women's position in society is um, increasingly contested. Um, um, since morning, we are <laughs> uh, uh, like I am just repeating the same thing that Pakistan started its family planning program in 1960s. But despite this early start, fertility has declined really slow. We have seen um, uh, that um, after the 1990s, uh, the fertility rate continued to decline, but at a slower pace. And uh, the recent estimate from Pakistan Demographic Health Survey of 2017 shows that the fertility is stalled. Uh, the current fertility rate is 3.6 births per woman. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, in fact, there is a percentage decline in current contraceptive use. 34% of currently married women are using any contraceptive method. Um, and uh, although the desire to stop childbearing is high among currently married women, that is around um, 42%, but the majority of women are not using contraception to avoid unintended births. Um, and it is observed that 16% of the births are unintended in nature. observe that married women who want no additional children but are not using contraception cited their dis husband's disapproval as the most common reason among non-fertility related reasons. Though in DHS, uh, the percentage is very low, that is 2.3%, but uh, different studies are showing, particularly the qualitative ones are the one that shows that husband disapproval is the main reason. Um, so what is interesting about Pakistan's fertility stall, it is that um, uh, though the rates are still very low, but um, uh, since 1990s, women education has improved. Um, so male literacy rate arose from 21% to 47%, and moreover, women um, uh, participation in paid work has increased as well. Uh, when it, um, then uh, the question rises that what is the missing link in Pakistan's family planning program. And in this research, I um, argued that, uh, that um, Pakistan's gendered and couple perspective is one of the missing links. Situation, uh, situating Pakistan's current fertility patterns within a gendered and couple level might provide us some more insights because we know that family system plays a significant role in reproductive behaviors and outcomes. And as I mentioned before, the husband fertility desire and attitudes takes the central priority. Um, as uh, in one of the study, uh, more women cited their husband's objection as a reason for known use of contraceptives than men cited their wife's objection to known use in Pakistan. And uh, moreover, communication about spouses, uh, communication between spouses about fertility may be limited. In this perspective, not only the gender dimensions of fertility, but spousal agreement on reproductive matter is often considered an important indicator of a couple's future reproductive behavior, as well as potential contraceptive use. Uh, if we look at the um, scenario of couple level research in Pakistan, so we find uh, very few studies that have used um, the couple level data 
One of the major reasons for um, this limited research is the lack of couple level data available. Um, though some surveys have questions on partner attitudes and desires, but responses are not very reliable, especially on subjective matter, because these responses usually favors the respondents' own fertility attitudes and desire. Because in these surveys, uh, women were asked what they think about the uh, fertility desire of their partners. Uh, and those uh, studies that are available, they are usually dated or regional level qualitative studies. But in previous studies, we have observed that, um, uh, for instance, one study done by Mahmoud in 1998, we observed that 40% of the couples had dissimilar fertility desires. Uh, and desire for a few children was higher among women, but that uh, were more likely, uh, but um, uh, that women were more likely to disapprove of family planning. And uh, another study uh, observed that uh, husband influence was stronger in deciding whether to use contraception than wives. Overall, then earlier studies demonstrated the importance of both spouses, uh, spouses' fertility goals for reproductive behavior, yet there has been little research. So in this um, study, um, we, uh, um, we argue that research on solely men or women data may produce misleading results and research that examines the relative influence of husband and wife's fertility preferences in sh shaping their reproductive behavior is, uh, may provide us some new insight into the decision-making process. So this lead us to our uh, the, the research question. In this research study, uh, uh, we came up with this question that how has the joint distribution of wives and husband fertility preferences changed over time? Because uh, for this study, um, I used data from 1990 and 2018 DHS. Uh, so we wanted to see that in this time period when the women education has improved and overall the socio uh, demographic aspect of Pakistan has um, uh, uh, changed. So what happens with the uh, couple's fertility preferences? Uh, then we looked at when couples disagree on fertility preferences, which partner fertility preferences are most strongly related to contraception. And has this changed over time? And lastly, we have um, asked that how is women's educational attainment related to contraceptive use and has its important change over time? Uh, looking at change over time is especially important given the dramatic changes in women's um, uh, education. Um, um, then uh, moreover, Pakistani society is uh, modernizing with increased exposure to modern family ideals. By modern family ideas, I mean that uh, lifestyles, values, and attitudes that favor smaller families. Widespread messaging about the importance of smaller uh, families through media, um, through different uh, um, uh, dramas, and through different talk shows, and that may alter both men's and women's view about family size and contraceptive behaviors. Um, uh, there are many other avenues of diffusion of new ideas. Um, and in this case, we are talking about contraceptive behaviors through personal social interactions and broader social factors such as the media. Um, to answer this question, we use data, uh, uh, match couple data for Pakistan Demographic Health Survey of 1990 and 2017. Uh, we pulled surveys to observe change over time in contraceptive use. The dependent variable for this uh, study is the current contraceptive use. DHS asks women that, uh, are you currently doing something or using any method or to avoid getting pregnant? Uh, because the current contraceptive use question was not asked from the men, so following other studies, um, uh, we are also, if a men report that they are using any method, then we, um, as the, the uh, couple is using, um, Contraception right now. Yeah, the first was what happened in case of disagreement among couple about the fertility intentions. So uh, our uh, main independent variable is here couples agreement in fertility intentions, uh, and we um, uh, defined it as both want another child, only wife wants another child, only husband wants another child or both don't want another child. And another important variable is to look uh, at the uh, uh, educational gradient and whether it still exists or not. So we um, uh, added wife's education and we control for various socio-demographic variables, such as women's work status, 
um, couple educational homogamy, then um, age difference, sun preference, we control for that as well. Um, so um, these are the results. So if uh, these are the sample characteristics across the both surveys. So uh, what we see is that the contraceptive use has increased among couples significantly between these two time periods from 12% to 40%, uh, 40%. Um, and uh, the only thing which I really want you to uh, pay attention is that the majority of couples, if we see in this uh, table, agreed on their fertility preferences at both time points. And when agreement is when both want another child or both don't want another child. Okay, with more couples uh, often agreeing that they want to have another child, then they did not want more children. Um, in light of uh, widespread changes in women empowerment, as well as the promotion of smaller family ideals. However, we asked whether couples were less likely to disagree about fertility preferences over time. Indeed, we found that uh, the disagreement among couples uh, on the desire for additional child decreased by about four percentage points between 1990 and 2017, a small but statistically significant shift. However, husband continued to be more pronatalist than wives in both time period. If we look at this, only wife wants versus only husband wants. Um, uh, and this um, support the uh, work of, uh, that suggests that during the course of demographic transition in highly gendered society, women are first to internalize, internalize the desire for smaller family, families. Uh, this is um, the graph shows the current contraceptive use by couples' fertility preferences. And we expected that the husband fertility preferences would have more influence on contraceptive use. That is when cu couple disagree contraceptive use will be lower when husband wants to have another child. Instead, uh, we found that contraceptive use is higher among these couples in which wife wants to stop the childbearing. And the difference in contraceptive use between those in which only wife wants versus only husband wants has widened between these two time periods. Uh, and if we look at the um, current contraceptive use by education, then we see that the contraceptive use is higher among uh, educated women than women with no formal education. Um, and again, uh, contraceptive use has increased between 1990 and 2017 across all educational educate, um, categories. However, the important thing which I want to highlight here is that the increase is much higher among women with no formal education and primary educated women. Uh, this suggests that education association with contraceptive use seems to have weakened over time. Uh, this is the results of logistic regression model predicting uh, current contraceptive use. It is straightforward to uh, understand that when both spouses do not want to have another child, they will use um, contraception compared to couple, uh, couples who both want to have more children. Um, however, in case of disagreement, we observed that the contracept, uh, we were expecting that contraceptive use will be low when husband wants to have another child. However, we found um, support for the opposite pattern. With contraceptive use higher when only the husband uh, um, wants another child, but the wife does not. Um, it seems that women's fertility preferences outweigh, at least in Pakistan. Uh, however, this pattern is unexpected, but we have seen um, this in other settings such as Sub-Saharan Africa. The stronger association between women's fertility preferences and flect aspects of family planning service delivery, family planning methods and programs, because they are often geared towards women, which may give women more access, ability, and permission to use contraception when they do not want to have another child, even if their husband does. Uh, perhaps as a woman's domain, women's reproductive behavior. And uh, to check uh, demographic health survey that contraception is women business. So women may also use contraception 
covertly, but we don't have data to investigate that possibility. Um, second, um, given the shifts in um, women's education environment context, as well as doing this, we also revisited the link between education and contraceptive use. Um, the results supports our hypothesis that educated women, especially those who, who have secondary and above education, are significantly more likely to use contraception than women with no formal education. However, we also considered that the links uh, between um, uh, women's own education and contraceptive use might have changed over time in light of Pakistan's modernization trend. Uh, uh, the result did support hypothesis that the education gradient weakened as contraceptive use increased substantially among uneducated women. I have not shown the full model, but in model four, if we look at the um, coefficient of year variable, so you see that it has significantly increased uh, uh, from model two to model four. So uh, it, this, uh, the coefficient of year indicates that the odd of using contraception among women with no formal education has increased by four times between 1990 and 2017. So in short, um, what we found is that in instances of disagreement among couples on fertility preferences, a wife's preferences are more strongly related to contraceptive use than her husband's preferences. Mm. This is contrary to what might be expected in a traditional society such as Pakistan, in which husbands generally have more power in the relationship. But this result indicate that even if men uh, have more authority in household decision making, um, that power does not seem to drive contraceptive use among couples. However, more research is needed to understand how and why women are able to exert their own influence in this domain, but not in other ones. Um, nonetheless, it, this suggests that investment in family planning programs that support and broaden women's knowledge of and access to contraception continues to be worthwhile. Moreover, we observe that women's education is strongly associated with contraceptive use, and the educational gradient of contraceptive use has diminished over time, consistent with the diffusion processes. And this is again not a sur very surprising finding as studies from our neighboring countries. India has also observed the same, that contraceptive use is increasing more among women with no formal education. And uh, this provides um, evidence of an ongoing, um, if slow fertility transition. But the, at the same time, it shows that wom women's own socioeconomic characteristics such as education are not no longer the only productive of their fertility, uh, only predictors of their fertility behaviors. So to conclude, um, uh, because the overall, um, the overall low level of contraceptive prevalence rate in Pakistan suggests continued attention is needed to support Pakistan family planning program um, by thinking of innovative ways to generate demand. Um, as we have observed that knowledge about contraception is universal. All the data is showing that, but there is um, an increase in unmet need over time and unmet need for family planning among men should be considered um, because our findings uh, that couples in which both partners want to limit childbearing are more likely to use contraception than couples in which only wife wants to limit childbearing suggest men's preferences are more important influence on couple level reproductive behavior. Um, men also have different set of practical concerns. For example, Kamran et al. in 2014 uh, observed that husband cited cost and lack of availability of services as primary reasons for not using contraception. Um, and again, a couple's fertility preferences are essentially a direct uh, decision. Therefore, efforts to promote family planning uh, will be more effective when husbands are more involved and more approving of contraception and they revise their fertility goals to match with the fertility goals of their wives. Um, however, more in-depth studies that focus on cultural context of the society are also needed. Uh, again, um, uh, the educational gradient still exists, but we need to also look into uh, that, um, what are the diffusion mechanism as we observe that the contraceptive use has increased significantly among women with uh, no formal education. Um, so we need to tap that. Uh, we need to uh, look at the avenues from where they are getting this information and what type of um, social interaction they are having 
to have more productive uh, research. So that's all. Thank you so much. And uh, if there is any question, I'm more than glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saima Bashir. Thank you for uh, highlighting the factors imp impacting fertility behavior. And it's really interesting to know how women's fertility preferences outweigh men. So thank you very much. You provide some very valuable insights, especially with regards to you know, improving our counseling and looking at more uh, the perspective of couples. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, so now we've uh, come to the end of this uh, panel discussion, and I'd like to really thank uh, the FCU and especially the Department of PRC uh, for arranging this uh, very important and very uh, uh, constructive uh, discussion and the panel discussion. Uh, let me also thank the rector of FCU, uh, the dean, and especially uh, record my appreciation for all the efforts that were put in by Dr. Vakas, who is the director of the PRC. I'd like to really congratulate the FCU for setting up the PRC, which has really in a very short period of time uh, established itself as a very vibrant center. And we have heard this morning some very thought provoking, very valuable and informative presentations by globally recognized uh, luminaries who have touched upon various aspects of the population dynamics confronting Pakistan. Uh, we have heard that our population growth, we have grown by six times since our independence. Our fertility rate has not come down. And the levels we see there through the levels that we see in other countries in the region, uh, which puts us uh, as an outlier in the region. And, and we've also heard about how this all this is impacting upon our development uh, prospects. Uh, we, we, uh, the messages that have come out clearly from all the presentations are that we would have to look at a more multi-sectoral approach if we have to work towards bringing our population level, uh, population growth to stabilization levels. We would have to work on uh, the demand side as well as the supply side. And the areas that we would have to focus would include improving educational levels, uh, focusing on economic development, uh, focusing on the availability and access to healthcare, especially also looking at the access to family planning services, because as we have learned, there is such a high and persistent high unmet need for family planning, and uh, and that can only uh, be met through the availability of, of services. Uh, we started many good programs in the past, and I would like to say uh, that one of the programs that really impacted initially on, on our fertility trajectory was the Lady Health Worker Program. Uh, an excellent program, and if the, uh, unfortunately, with the passage of time, uh, the direction of the lady health workers uh, got shifted from plan planning. And perhaps now, as as part of the solutions that we heard, uh, one of them would be that we should refocus uh, the attention of the lady health worker program and bring it back to the, its original mandate of providing plan planning services or focusing that within the whole uh, paradigm of primary health care. Uh, we, we, we've heard the importance uh, of how education is so very linked uh, to fertility decisions and behavior change. And uh, education, I think that it's really appalling that in this 21st century, when countries have moved so much ahead, we still have higher, uh, high numbers of uh, uneducated people and as well as the as the and, and, and high numbers of out of school uh, boys and girls. So in our quest to Im enhance their skills and their employability and their ability to graduate out of poverty, education will be an extreme is an extremely important uh, element. And it's unfortunate that despite the cons the, the constitutional provision twenty five A that makes it mandatory for uh, everyone to get education. We still have uh, that uh, children who are not going to school. Uh, we've heard about the importance of uh, gender equality, women empowerment, and bringing more women into the labor force. Uh, and so we have now several opportunities available to us. We have, uh, I think, a very, for the first time, a very comprehensive plan of action that has been approved by the Council of Common Interest, developed in 2018 by subject experts. 
some of the experts like Dr. Zeba and uh, Ms. Janal Fazilani participated in the development of that plan of action. And so, so, so we have a road, roadmap and now it's a question of how it's implemented, how we are making people accountable for its implementation. We have a new narrative on population dynamics. We have moved away from the Do Bache Khushal Kharana theme. We are now talking about balance. We are talking about a balance between resources and rights. We're talking about responsibilities. So, so, so the, the, the theme has changed, making it more acceptable to the people, especially the, those who might have be thought uh, may, may you know, oppose this because now we, we have a religious consensus also, all religious political parties, all religious scholars approve of the idea that we are talking in terms of improving health and well-being of mothers and children. So there's nothing contrary to the Islamic teachings with, re, with that regard. So overall, as I said, we have a op tremendous opportunity available if we are able to really implement the CCI plan of action and letter and spirit. I think we can shift the trajectory. Uh, we can uh, achieve population stabilization. Otherwise, as we have heard, the consequences are horrendous. So once again, I'd like to thank the PRC for, uh, for arranging this uh, important uh, seminar and also all the uh, panelists who took out time uh, to prove and and to spoke on this occasion. Thank you very much, and thank you, and Allah Hafiz from my side. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Uh, I would like to uh, now open the floor for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please raise your hands, and uh, we'll address those questions one by one. Yes, please. I see a hand, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Jamal, uh, please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vokas. I have very good thoughts on the population in Pakistan and issues have been warmed up and we have been observing this dimension in a different ways. Uh, I would like to short comment on the three uh, presentations today in this session. The first one is regarding population explosion or population bomb. I want to know definitely the population explosion or the population bomb is related to the fertility. But in this presentation, no analysis has been given about the approximate determinants of fertility. And much more said about um, different projections. The projection variants should be shared with us under which variants these product projections have been taken and particularly the data. And comparison of the contraceptive use with the Global is not a suitable idea that Pakistan alone stand country is being compared with the whole global issue. So why not take a success story from the China? And China is a big uh, populated country as compared to Pakistan, what they have changed, how they motivated the minds of their people and what infrastructure they have provided. Rather than giving this an idea that we are really in a very difficult and bad situation and this population is going to be very much different for us, I think the positive side of the story should be focused. And the second comment is on high population growth rate and its linkages. The whole presentation was based on one um, report with multiple data sources. Kindly enlighten us, make the linkages with some theoretical model and try to find the transition probabilities that this particular dimension has this transition probability so that the policy stakeholders can grab on that these are the key policy areas identified through some significant model that we really need to work initially in this ways on these dimensions which are really been linked with this high population growth. And the last one is on couple level research in Pakistan. The whole analysis was run from 1990 to 2017 PDHS and the comparison was made on 1998 Mahmoud's paper my question is, if any respondent is 40 years of age in 1919 PDHS, how the data could be pooled in an effective manner? And such findings should be taken on at this 2021. I think it would be a better idea if you pool the data for 2012 and 2017 and come up with some regression logistic model. And these results would be really beneficial for the uh, study. Thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamal, for your candid comments. Would any of the uh, presenters or experts like to address some of the issues that he's raised?
can i answer to the first question please go ahead sir so uh, i don't exactly remember mainly i think he is asking that why i didn't ask uh, talk about fertility and secondly that i presented a gloomy picture so the gloomy picture is there is uh, not going away is basically if we say that positive things which are not there then it will be deceiving ourselves so uh, but the first question i think fertility was <laughs> very much there like uh, <clears throat> fertility comes down uh, through you know uh, mainly through family planning because pakistan is a country where i think uh, as uh, uh, in the morning i think somebody also mentioned i try to avoid uh, exclude those things uh, which were already said that uh, age at marriage is increasing and uh, abortions uh, rates are very high actually extremely exceptionally high so basically i think these are the two major determinants and the third is the family planning so uh, family planning is 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 the center stage thing because family planning will also prevent the abortions family planning will also like you know improve women's health and uh, so what is happening in pakistan the story of family planning in pakistan is the country which has started a family planning program Uh, supported by the government where the political will was there in 1960s is behind all other neighbors you know uh, in the region so basically uh, this is a point to consider and this is like you know where we have to and i think uh, the answer to the uh, the problem is also very clear is right in front of us that we talk but we don't act and until we stop talking and start acting nothing will change so there's i think very clear my message is to to everybody who's listening to me is this that i think uh, better like uh, try to convince you know uh, wherever you are in whichever your area of influence is uh, convince the people who have the power to change things that please start uh, supplying uh, contraceptives iud's to health facilities in the public sector it's a very very simple quest request you know so this is was going to change uh, uh, the things uh, from from worse to better thank you so much thank you sir um Are can it? i ans- answer as well yes please uh, okay uh, so uh, dr jabal um, uh, mahmood paper was done on 19 19- 1990 demographic health survey data okay and then uh, 1990 data was the first one where the couple level data was collected after that i did this analysis with 2012 and 13 but the results were the same okay um second uh, the point was to comparing with that is that uh, why the couple level research is important why do we need to look at the preferences of both husband and wife uh, because uh, we have found that in ma- majority of the instances there is a disagreement about uh, fertility goals and, um, and that can influence the reproductive behavior of the uh, couples that's why the major um, uh, objective of doing this research was to look through it a couple lens because most of the research in pakistan is only being done on women's data the uh, questions are asked from the women and they are responding even on the behalf of their husband so that cannot give us the true picture of what is happening here i think we lost dr saima uh, dr saima can you hear us uh, yeah i am done uh, i answered the question Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Dr. Jamal. You wanted to ask another question, sir. Yes. Uh, I have Thank a question. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very Please much, Dr. Vakas. I'm I'm not going to on counter argument that everyone is presented well, and this is the time uh, we need to think on. our family planning program we are focusing since 60 years on the family planning program and doing these many policies continuous motivation scheme to the religious leaders involvement to all respected audience this is the time to think the new dimension 
why the pakistani women are not ready why this nation is not ready to reach the below replacement fertility we need another research we need to shift our thoughts on a different way you know by having the family in pakistan is the security of the family these women are more secure in the family when they have 3 to 4 to 5 kids so you need you as a demographers need to focus on it that by putting the program factor side and analyzing it is a good for research purposes good for other sides purposes but try to explore what's inside the mind why we have not motivated the minds of the women in our society why c section the ratio is the highest in the world in our country after having the difficult difficult surgical procedure they are still having the babies we have to think on these dimensions the qualitative studies may go on to give us an idea that which components are really needed to add on on the demographic and health surveys and new dimensions need to be explored however uh, thank you very much for again giving this time thank you very much dr jamal uh, uh, dr saima would you like to respond um i think you so much dr jamal for raising such important question and here we are not saying that we should we are talking about the intersectoral linkages and don't take um, uh, population program in silos we are talking about that we need a very comprehensive approach but at the same time we cannot like uh, sometimes you need to document the things these documentation is showing that since 1960 nothing is happening in our population program and population is not going down as far as you are talking about why women are having more children and why because the opportunity cost of having a child is not high in pakistan why it's not high women are not literate they don't have any education and those who have education they are not entering into labor force or if they want to enter they don't have opportunities to enter into the labor force until your women are not entering in the labor force their opportunity cost is not going to be high other and there are some other multiple cultural reasons as well uh, for instance in pakistan cousin marriages are still constitute 50% of our marriages are within first cousin marriages so they find that family support to raise their children as well mm, some preference we talked about but uh, i think the major is when women will enter into the labor market their opportunity cost for having more children will raise and then ultimately your um, so everything will work uh, together it's not that you will only focus on one program and in silos you can uh, achieve uh, your objectives you need to have a very comprehensive approach education labor market health everything needs to come in hand thank you thank you dr saima dr farid medad sir please go ahead yeah quickly i think uh, i agree with saima that uh, you know the historical uh, analysis of family planning programs failure will actually give us a lot of information because we haven't done so i don't think uh, i'm not sure if i agree with the idea of having like a new uh, kind of intervention because uh, right now if you look at the figures from the latest survey dhs uh, uh, 9% women are using uh, traditional methods which are basically you know useless and uh, there is about 20% unmet need which is uh, lower than the previous surveys but still is there so if we focus on that it actually is telling us that they, these are the couples who are using who are not using modern methods of family planning and they should be using so the market research which i mentioned in my one of my slides was to focus on uh, this segment of the population and also the others who may not be you know uh, fourth with in in basically who may want to you know use uh, family planning methods on their own terms you know <clears throat> what they want to use how they want to use it when they want to use it you know what is the dynamics between the couple you know all those things need to be researched and that's where i agree yeah we need a new research and we need a new research basically to see why have we failed and uh, unfortunately we haven't learned from our failures so this is probably the time to do that thank you thank you very much dr farid uh, dr nasra shah uh, you have a comment please go ahead um, you're muted madam yeah. i can't hear you yeah 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 i, I am muted um Okay, I mean, I, I also did my doctoral dissertation on husband-wife communication and contraceptive use. 
So I've looked at these issues also over a very long time. Now, um, having been overseas and seeing change come about in places which were very traditional, such as the Gulf countries. Okay, now there, it's de well, development was taking place in terms of education, in terms of women's participation in the labor force. And even though it's very patriarchal and all of that, yet fertility levels are going down fairly rapidly, even in the Gulf countries. Um, and and uh, right now, uh, I mean, Kuwait and Pakistan are, are, are at about the same level. Uh, Saudi is even lower than that. Okay, so in the case of Pakistan, I agree that we don't really understand why people and women and men want the next child. Why do they keep on having children? And one of the things that we did not discuss enough today was the role that religious beliefs play in shaping those motivations. That in terms of that Allah Malik hai, Allah Razik hai, how strong is this belief? That, that then uh, even trying to control fertility is regarded as perhaps a sin. So we don't understand those, uh, those motivations at the community level very well. That kind of research is missing in the DHS, it has to be done in a qualitative manner. And so I hope, I hope that good qualitative research will begin to establish more clearly people's motivations for why do they not want to have fewer children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nasra. I actually had a question which is open to any panelists who want to take it. Um, and I'll place it as an extension of the, the argument that you uh, sort of presented. Uh, Dr. Fareed Medhi uh, said that uh, we need aggressive policies that take us towards contraception use. Uh, from uh, Mr. Mukaddar Shah's comments, I also felt that uh, it's high on the agenda of uh, organizations like the UNFPA that contraception use uh, needs to increase. Uh, my question is uh, related to, and, and Dr. Ali Mir mentioned that in the new policy, uh, the religious element, or at least the religious leaders are on board uh, with this idea. Uh, my question relates to cultural impediments, uh, where there are uh, a lot of people in Pakistan who may not be uh, favorable to the idea of contraception, uh, contraceptive use in their families. And how uh, are there any plans related to address uh, th these cultural or social issues, uh, which may be uh, very prevalent uh, in the lack of use of contraceptives among especially rural communities? Dr. Nasra or Dr. Fareed uh, or Dr. Ali, any uh, anybody who would like to answer to this? I'll, I'll uh, make a short comment on it, Dr. Bakas, if you allow me. Thank you so much. I know. <clears throat> I think you're raising some issues around culture, rural communities, and. Uh, uh, contraceptive practices. I think uh, Dr. Sama's uh, presentation was really, I must say, excellent, very detailed, very analytical, talking about spousal responses and the typical <clears throat> or the pre prevailing response of the wife or the mate uh, of the husband and how different they are and how different uh, factors uh, impact upon uh, the ability of the woman to express her. Uh, preferences for her interest in adopting them. But this is the larger issue. You see, the larger issue is 
as we all know, that uh, this is a highly patriarchal society. So when you talk about cultural differences, this is a system of how our society is ordered, how it's structured, how it has been. And this, these sorts of structures are extremely difficult to uh, change, to overcome. And what, we are, what are we all talking about here? In all the various sessions, we are looking at how can behavior change take place? How, and what is that behavior change that we are seeking to happen in Pakistan, which has happened in other countries due to several different interventions that the government has made? So one of the constraining factors in behavior change anywhere in the world is the prevailing cultural system of, of power. It's a power relationship system. And uh, power dynamics, relationships that uh, subordinate other relationships. So a woman is in a subordinated position. Uh, similarly, as often countries are in a subordinated position because they have such a difficult economic um, situation and they get subordinated to global financial systems and external development partners and external lending agencies. And so this freedom is not there. Similarly, at the level of decision-making on adoption of uh, CPR, uh, is hampered and constricted by the, st the structures of society in the face of women. And uh, I think there's been some discussion before, so I don't want to just prolong it. There's a lot of evidence on the table. There's a lot of analysis. Uh, how can cultural barriers be removed? Who are the uh, commonly held, uh, respected influences in society that can talk about such changes? And we heard Dr. Ali Mir and also others talk about the fact that the clergy has been involved, other influences have been involved, etc. But it, these are fairly complex, uh, uh, complex questions. And cultural practice tend to predominate more in traditionally structured societies, such as in Khabar Pakhtunkhwa or areas of uh, Balochistan or southern Punjab than they do in metropolitan cities. So uh, it's it's not there's no one response to how do you deal with cultural factors. I think it's completely different. The one significant change that has taken place, uh, not only in Pakistan but across the world, is social media. You see, previously the influencer was a physical person that you either listened to, you went to, or uh, you heard the influencer, religious or otherwise community leaders. But now social media accesses uh, just about everyone can be accessed through social media. So my sense is that cultural change is happening. It is happening quite rapidly, but perhaps it's not fully documented. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, Dr. Fareed Medit, you also have a response to A quick addition to, uh, I completely agree that <clears throat> there is a need for research in the cultural barriers and the joint family dynamics and the interspousal communication. We really don't have uh, much data and I completely agree with uh, Madam Shanaz that also uh, cultural uh, barriers are, are moving, you know, basically it's not the same uh, population we used to talk about, you know, it's a very different population. Younger women are much more, you know, literate and also aware, you know, because of the social media. Uh, but I think in spite of all that, uh, we do have, the women do have barriers and, you know, the family restrictions. In spite of all that, a fairly large proportion of women want to use a modern method of family planning, but they're not using it, you know. And precisely 29%, I would say, according to the, you know, uh, latest DHS, that's the, that's the proportion. It's a large proportion. So add 25 to 29 and you reach like, you know, your target. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that uh, from the supply side, you know, there's a lot of discussion and demand side and there's a tendency, unfortunately, among <clears throat> those responsible to put the blame on the demand side. But I would like to like highlight that, yeah, there is also a supply side deficit and that's where we should focus right now, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
Uh, if there are no more questions, I would now take this opportunity to conclude this second session of the panel discussion. This has been a wonderful uh, experience for all of us, and, uh, and we should do it more. I would like to thank each and every one uh, uh, who participated in this event. Our special thanks to all our panelists, Dr. Gavin Jones, Professor Eric Fong, uh, Dr. Ghulam, Mohammad Arif, Dr. Minaj Kadwani, Dr. Fareed Midhat, Dr. Nasra Shah, Dr. Madam Shahnaz Wazir Ali, Mr. Mukadar Shah, Dr. Naeem Majid, uh, Dr. Saima Bashir, of course, Dr. Zeba Sattar and Dr. Ali Meer for chairing both sessions, our chief guest, Dr. Adelton, and our head, Dr. Sikandar Hayat. Uh, also, I would like to uh, thank uh, Ms. Saima Shah and Ms. Zalla Khattak from the Population Council for helping uh, uh, in arranging this, this event. Uh, it was invaluable help uh, that we received from the Population Council. I would also like to thank our partners uh, from UNFPA, uh, our members of the PRC Advisory Board, especially Dr. Sufyan, Dr. Gloria Caleb, Dr. Muhammad Ali Bhatti, Dr. Sharun Hanouk, and Mr. Kashif Shafiq. Uh, I would also like to uh, give a shout out to uh, our departmental representatives, Dr. Hafiz Rizwan Ahmed, Dr. Khadija Shakrola, Dr. Samia Ayub, and Mr. Asazi. I would uh, like to thank Higher Education Commission and OREC FCCU uh, for their help in arranging this event. Uh, lastly, uh, but not least, I would like to thank the PRC team uh, who, which has been working for over a month uh, in, in arranging this, this event. Uh, special thanks to Mr. Jawad Tarek, Ms. Khizra Nasir, uh, Ms. Shanze Ahmed, Ms. Fatma Alam, and Mr. Muhammad Lutullah. And uh, a very special thanks to Ms. Fatma, who has been a linchpin uh, for arranging this entire event. Uh, with these words, I would like to thank all of you again uh, the proceedings uh, of this event will be reduced uh, into a, a shape of a book or uh, uh, and, and uh, that book will be available to anyone who emails to us. We will also make it publicly available. So please do contact us if, if you're interested. The video will also be uploaded uh, on a publicly accessible website or possibly YouTube. And we will, uh, of course, uh, reach back to you uh, in, in terms of information of how the video uh, can, can be accessed. Thank you very much again. Uh, this concludes our panel discussion. The conference will start uh, at 2.30. Uh, these are, will be two concurrent panels. Uh, so please have a look at our poster that we shared with you. And uh, please decide whichever panel would fit you better or whichever panel you would be more interested in attending. Thank you very much and see you all at 2.30. Love. Uh, correction, it's 3.30. We'll be meeting at 3.30. Thank you very much. Glass up. Oh. Yeah. Yeah.